due to lack of medical services. In his decision, Judge Byron Ongaya also called on the national and county governments not to take disciplinary action against the doctors who on strike in an effort to make the negotiation successful and agree on the return of medical services. The court also ordered KMPDU to allow some of its members to serve Kenyans at level 3 and level 5 hospitals and at national and referral hospitals such as the Madari National Hospital. However, KMPDU says that despite the ongoing strike, it has been allowing some of its members to serve Kenyans in various hospitals, but now this will only happen if there is a negotiation on the return to work formula. Despite the strike, we have given, we have we let out the, the medical superintendent to be working in some hospitals. And that has been happening. And so for us to have any meaningful minimum services uh, in any hospital, we must have a meeting. We must have a sitting. But as it is now, all the doctors are out until governments call for that meeting. As we will wait, whether it takes 60 days, whether it takes 100 days, as long as it takes, because we are out for a reason. We didn't go on strike for fun. We are going on strike because all the things that we have been demanding have been wished away. These well, doctors are criticizing health. Yes, Susan Homicha following allegations of lying to MPs when she appeared before them over their strike. KMPDU Secretary General W. Taylor has also vowed that the doctors will not return to work until they reach an agreement with the government on how to end the strike government was saying that we have to suspend the strike before we have the whole of nation engagement. Court has been very clear on it that there should be no any conditions for that particular engagement. And we say as we continue with our strike, we must have a sit down and a return to work agreement that gives the sanctity of this particular CBA, that protects it in entirety, that ensures that there is implementation of the demands we have, that the 19 issues cannot be wished away in any way. This is Deputy Secretary General KMPDU, Dr. Dennis Miskala, criticized C.S. Nahomicha's statement regarding the interest of apprentice doctors, saying that at no time has the Ministry of Health submitted a request to KMPDU to negotiate to resolve the ongoing strike contrary to what she explained to the MPs when she was interviewed. Regarding uh, the strike and for me to give a definite date as to when the doctors will come back to, will go back to work. Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, I would like to say I am not able to confirm with certainty that then by tomorrow they'll be back to work. The guidelines we received from SRC is that the interns ought to get a stipend and not a remuneration. So the stipend that was offered is 70,000 shillings. And that is what we have offered. Now the yet to be commissioned Bunga Towers is facing controversy from the would-be occupants. Now National Assembly Speaker Moses Tangula has since fired warning shots to the legislators against negative connotations towards the multi-billion project, stating that they might be summoned before the House Privileges Committee. Those members who have been pouring vitriol on this process, in fact may find themselves before the Powers and Privileges Committee. Because they're saying things without proof, they're saying things that are utterly untrue, there are six high-speed lifts, six or five, all working as efficiently as any building you can find in Manhattan in the U.S. Working effectively. The offices are ready Furniture has been assembled in every office. There are some that are still going on. Some MPs had wanted to be given an official occupancy certificate to show that the building is safe before moving into the Motangula However, has asked the MPs to ignore the allegation, saying that as of Tuesday this week, approximately 58 MPs had moved to the offices in Bungat House. Even in your villages, when you are starting a new home, you can move into your house before you complete putting your windows, your ceiling, and live in it and get it sprouted up to be the modern house you want. We have a stark choice between leaving that building to be a white elephant or moving in, working in it, and making things work as we go along the way. In any event, if we need any money to improve the building further, it will come to this house for appropriation. This is new to him, Dennis Asset. A good morning.
102.5 Spice FM Kisumu The following takes place from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every weekday on Spice FM. If you go out of this country and come back the same person, then you have a problem. Buy land, one million. Put it there for five years. What's the purpose? It will have increased in value. No, that's the thing. That's darkness. You know, that's an eclipse. Mm -hmm. You don't do that. I hope you don't believe that Hasla is a poor person or that Asla, all Aslas are poor. I've seen that conversation. Tell us, who is that? So who is Asla? Asla is a person who is uh, making his a living through hard work. Corruption in Kenya is a political accusation. The people who are actually corrupt are not pointed fingers at. Kenya is not free. Mm -hmm. Kenya in Mexico and Amateka is under siege. Have you seen that lodge on Nanyerera Road? Very high fence, you can't even Windows see deep inside. Windows up near the ceiling. Yes. <gasps> and if you walk there at midnight, you see bats the size of cows. <laughs> <laughs> and when it rains, it doesn't rain on that building. Yes. <laughs> when you're at All Saints mm. and it's raining, <laughs> it doesn't rain on that building. <laughs> The things people will believe. Well, yeah. The situation of Tiano Lumumba. Karibu sana. Asante sana. CT Muga. <laughs> CT Lodge. Uh, Muga. Muga, not Muga. He is here and he is the day's problem. One man marries a woman. Another man marries trouble. Is he the same man? <laughs> Spice. A lion cannot eat more than two dangles. It would die a natural death because there is no ICU in the forest. In Kenya, it has become the situation that you cannot conduct two elections. In fact, With the Bukati, same IBC. Uh, you, you can't. I tell you about this Indian friend of mine who was uh, enjoying other Indians in the group. He wrote the word valve and told them, read it. <laughs> so how did he say it? I really want to know. The valve. <laughs> <laughs> Koskina Edna, it's the, the, the you said the bees are the peace. Kira kitu mukabu mukisia kisema atazema obus. Obus? Mukisema yana zema obus. Opposite. Oh, kiskiri sana mbaya kudaskia obus. The Situation Room Spice, the only way to start your day. Good morning. It's Thursday and also I'm almost coming to the end of the week, but let's see what's happening on the roads this morning. Where are you? Um, it doesn't matter where you are right about now. You'll be fine. Getting in and out of the CBD is not going to be a problem. Um, not much coming off the thicker super highway, at least not for now. Uhuru Highway looks good all the way from the Nyaya Stadium roundabout out towards the city. Even at that highly Selassie Junction, we won't be seeing anything crazy for now. The Southern Bypass also looks good as you get to that Langata Road interchange. And then... Um, Hmm. Even coming off Magadi Road, nothing happening right about now. We'll probably see more action getting towards the weekend. On Jogo Road, nothing much has started to pop. Uh, getting out towards Landis and then through towards Kamkunji at the roundabout. And let's take a look at what's coming off of Outer Ring. Nothing much right now. It's, um, we're starting off Thursday. Let's see what happens as we go through it. And of course, hope that you'll talk to us. Let us know what might be going off Spice of MKE on X hashtag The Situation Room. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room, Eddie, the Eddie, only Eddie, way to start your day. Six o'clock. Good morning. On this 18th day of April, it's Thursday, the first one of the week. Abi, do we say today, Thursday, the first Friday of the week? Yeah, something like that. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Huh, huh? Welcome, and how are you doing? CT, good morning. Good morning, Ndu. Why are you buffering? 
I am not buffering. Mm -hmm. I am speaking. <laughs> if the system is buffering, mm. let it buffer away. Okay. Yes. You here though? How are you? I'm fine. I'm, well, I'm fine. Today is slightly warm. Oh, it is. Uh, you've noticed? My body tells me these things. Uh, mm, okay. Mm. It's warmer it, than it was yesterday. Yes, infinitely warmer. Even the weather outside is mm. warmer than it was yesterday. Oh, the weather outside is frightening. Dun, 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 dun. There's a song for everything, CT. But that one was snow and wind. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Let it snow. Oh, I, I, thought, uh, I thought it was let it rain. You know, we can, we can change it. Who says you can? Let no, it no, rain, no. let it rain, let it no, rain. No, but the rain is the raindrops keep falling on my head, isn't it? Raindrops keep falling on my head. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. Do, do, do. <laughs> <laughs> right <clears throat> right well good to know that you're all right i had a great day yesterday you did i had a, got a lot of things done i'm actually quite proud of myself you are yes i am it's good to be proud of yourself isn't it <laughs> it's momentary no most <laughs> it's things momentary are, most things in okay. li most things in life are precisely that momentary <laughs> yay okay yes but it's good i'm glad we're here and everybody's here edna is even smiling today it's fantastic uh getting into it this morning quite a number of conversations and it's um what we're going to kick off with today it is it's justice thursday we're going to be looking at a different kind of uh, legal talk today um the brand banking new uh, president of the lsk in the person of one faith of Yambo. It's going to join us at seven o'clock and we're going to talk of the ro uh, about the role of the LSK and traversing strikes and legalities. There have been a number of things that have been said about uh, the current doctor strike, what's illegal, what's legal, what can the IG of police do or not do. So we'll be talking about that and she's coming into the seat, uh, first woman um, after a while in that position and let's hear what it is that, you know, the plans are for the LSK and, and um, what are some of the legalities and illegalities that we may or may not see. So she'll be with us here at 7 o'clock. And then Nairobi Senator Edwin Sifuna will be talking about things fall apart or not falling apart or whether the center is holding or whether it is not holding many conversations to be had with him and so he'll join us in the hot seat at eight o'clock and then there have been several conversations that have been happening around children over the last couple of months whether it's children in labor and when i say children in labor i mean work okay um and that whether children should or should not work a lawyer has taken a case to court uh just a couple of weeks ago and said that working your children over the school holidays could actually land you in a spot of trouble there have also been calls to close street homes um, i mean children's homes there have been calls to get children off of the street so there are very many conversations that are happening simultaneously so we're going to take a moment and look at some of these things uh today we'll look um uh, we'll talk with Sam um, Muniwini who is the executive director at the um African Institute for Children's Studies. And we'll be looking at the youth dividend in unemployment. We'll start off with that conversation today at nine o'clock. All right, so that's what we have in store today. We will take a look at some of those critical issues and uh, hoping that you can join us. We can see that y'all are trickling in this morning already. We're going to take a look at what the weather has in store for us today. What is the weatherman saying? And then we're going to come and say hello to you as we get into Kenya's biggest conversation today. It's 14 minutes after six o'clock. Karibuni Sana, good morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. The man who looks at a beautiful girl and doesn't talk to her will end up serving lunch at her wedding. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> City. Mm. Do like that. My father has killed a mouse. Will he fail to kill a man? I'm a wapanya. Small mm. mammal, mm. big mammal. Mm. 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 <laughs> What, what well, are how are we comparison? I mean, he killed mouse. What are they saying? What they're saying is, uh, my father has killed a man. <laughs> <laughs> Will he fail to kill a man? <laughs> <laughs> name, surprise. Someone's name. So, Did name surprise you? No, the name is surprise. <laughs> No, what am I saying? I'm from Nigeria, man. I met somebody <laughs> called I Believe. So See? Said, ah, your name is I Believe. Yes, my name is I Believe. But that's the short form. I said, excuse me? I said, yes. My no name problem. is I Believe. So what's no, the fool? No, I believe in the goodness of the... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the Situation Room. Kenya's biggest conversation. 
16 degrees and mostly clear conditions for a change in Nairobi this morning. We'll see highs of 25 and lows of 15. It's partly cloudy at 15 in Nakuru with highs of 26 and lows of 15. And we'll see lows of 16 in a mostly cloudy Nyeri currently at 16. Looking into Eldoret at 14, it's mostly clear. Highs of 26 and lows of 14. And Mombasa is partly cloudy at 25 with highs of 29. Malindi at 26 is partly cloudy with highs of 29 and lows of 25. And Kisumu at 21, clear this morning with highs of 30. We'll also see highs of 30 in a, mo- in a partly cloudy Kakamega at 19. Kampala raining this morning, light rain showers through the morning at 22 with highs of 28. And we're looking into a mostly cloudy Dar es Salaam at 24, we'll see highs of 30. Out into Johannesburg, partly cloudy at 12 with highs of 22 and Mogadishu at 28. We'll see sunny conditions through the morning with highs of 33 and lows of 27. It's 16 and mostly sunny in Addis Ababa already with highs of 24 and lows of 13. We're looking into a mostly clear Lagos at 28 with highs of 34 and Kinshasa's cloudy at 26 with highs of 32. Let's look into Beijing where it's sunny at 26 Thursday afternoon with highs of 28. Paris at 5, light rain going to highs of 13 and New York, I beg your pardon, London is cloudy at 6 with highs of 14 and in New York 10 degrees and cloudy with highs of 17 we'll see lows of 8 Spice FM Spice up your life Mature, intelligent talk every morning Spice up yourself Mornings done right. Uh, up and awake and Adam this morning and we're seeing all of you. Good morning. Rogers Nyange says good morning. I'm um, tuned in from Voy Kamakawaida Karibu Sana. Sebit Yusuf says good morning, Edna. <laughs> Eric Ndu, Eric will be back tomorrow. And CT from the United Arab Emirates. We are recovering from the previous day's rains. Yes, we saw that. It was crazy, wasn't it? That we saw water water everywhere uae was underwater literally because of the rain and it looks like it's going to continue so it's not just a kenya phenomenon in the airport where there's just water <laughs> it's everywhere it's everywhere apparently um even Sintabu says good morning and everybody uh ct eric charlotte and nyaboke in capital letters nyaboke is in capital letters you've been greeted properly Hey, Nyaboka gave me something to eat this morning. Nyaboka and Yeka gave me something to eat this morning. I've never had it in my life, but it's delicious. Hmm? What was it called? I can't remember what she said it was, but they gave me something to eat this morning. It was great. It was yummy. I must look for it again. But that's a story for another day. Chris Adede says, good morning. Um, Gumu. Thank you. Gumu. She gave me something called Gumu. Her and Diego. Just now. It's a Mondesi-like thing, huh? Yeah, something like that. But it was delicious. But, but very firm. It was quite firm <laughs> to bite through, but after the firmness of the biting, mm. it was yummy. Mm. Mm. I can't believe I've never had that before. Anyway, that was a, an experience. Uh, <laughs> Kennedy says, good morning. Tuned in. Um, hi, how was Team Spice FM? Very good. Monica Oile says, hello, Four Spices. We bless the name of the Almighty. Yes, we do. Let us give, let us give thanks to the higher power. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's time for spice and coffee, indeed. Looking forward to a great show. Greetings to Eric as well. And that's Sir George Gashoiri. Yes, we have greeted him. Not to worry. Adu Ali says, good morning from County 001. Um, good morning, Spice. Zeke says, good morning, Power Spice. Good morning to you. The Kikombe is tuning from uh, Phuket this morning. May your team frustrate you less next football season. Sorry, Arsenal. I know. Isaiah Miner says, good morning. Great team. Keep the great job. Thank you very much. One Mike is also tuned in today. Tano Teka says, good morning. George Okoth is greeting everybody greetable. And um, uh, says, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Habari Asubui. Salama Kabisa. Alfred um, Mwagandi says, good morning. Tibbs Moge, we see you. Tibbs, you need to tell us what your full name is. What does Tibbs stand for? We are intrigued. We want to know. Good morning, everybody. Um, Samuel Ondieki says, good morning. I'm tuned in from Kisi. Have a blessed day. And Ibrahim Omondi says, um, good morning. Top of the morning. Indeed, top of the morning to you. Jaquera says, good morning. From a springy Edmonton, Alberta, on this when on this Thursday, wishing you and the motherland the very best of Thursday. We see all of you guys this morning. And honestly speaking, great to have you here in the room once we get in and get started. Let's say hello to some other folks this morning. Um, 
Um, Bishogoro Omakaya says good morning tuned in from on Facebook here and uh, Ndu and CT Muga how are you Ndu tell me the meaning of the following in pigeon sabi waiting day <laughs> okay sabi is to know something right CT if I tell you you sabi my name what have I said that I know your name I'm asking you sabi my name do I know your name very good mm. now if I say waiting waiting you they do what am i saying well it simply means that you are waiting <laughs> it does not <laughs> okay let me tell you waiting means what so if i say waiting you they do what am i saying what are you doing the city a million stars to you do with them as you please then what was the last one they said no we've already done all of them i'll appreciate if you respond yes i've responded see now we've done class for the day ct the uh, able student has answered the question he has received his stars and we can carry on <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Karibuni sana. Like I was saying, you don't take it for granted that you're here with us every day. Uh, always great to have you here. Okay. There's a place. It's called Cape Verde on Francais. Cabo Verde on Portuguese. And in English? Cape Verde. Thank you. And there's a proverb. Indeed, there is. Mm -hmm. Not a proverb. There are many, many, many Proverbs. But there's the one for today. The one for today. Mm. Okay. An aging man gets closer to his land, and an aging husband gets closer to his wife. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I didn't listen to the proverb. Of course you did. But let me repeat it Thank again so that you. you can listen again. <laughs> an aging man, an aging man, a man who's getting old, yeah. gets closer to his land, and an aging husband gets closer to his wife. Okay. Straightforward, simple, Easy. to the point. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say? We got it. Kabisa. To make gotcha. Right. Okay. Mm. Let's look at the headlines before we, you know, do anything else. Do that one properly. Let's oh. see what people have to say about that one today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yesterday was an interesting day, wasn't it? And it's made it into the column inches of the papers today. Civil servants' jobs to go in wage bill cuts. That's on the front page of the standard this morning. Civil servants with fake academic papers. That statement alone tickled me pink because there is the knowledge there is the acknowledgement that these individuals exist and you know pop and plain sight but what we are saying is that they will be the first to exit and money paid to them recovered as Reuters administration announces a plan to cut the wage bill that gobbles up 44 to 47 percent of the revenue instead of desired 35 percent so those are the first those are the first guys to go you guys who have fake certificates and have lied to us and have been eating our money you out we'll look at the details of some of the things that were said on the closing day of this uh, 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 conference that was taking place on thicker road blow as intern teacher posts declared illegal over 60,000 tutors hired by the teacher service commission as interns may force their employer to pay them full salary for the period served after a court found that the commission violated their rights to fair labor practice so you can't hire essentially what they're saying is that you cannot hire interns to be tutors in junior secondary you must hire full staff teachers so all this thing that they've been doing this whole time you uh, have been violating the law essentially is what the courts are saying but we'll look into the details of that there's this brand's swanky new building called Bunge Towers. It cost 9.8 billion shillings to complete. It took 14 years to complete. It cost twice the original price. Now, folks are moving in. Others are saying, eee, terrible. Speaker and MPs clash over 9 billion shillings Bunge Towers. Claims of poor workmanship rocks house over the 9.8 billion Bunge Towers whose construction dragged on for more than 14 years and whose costs doubled. After all that, some of them are saying, eee, we don't want to be here. <laughs> so it was an interesting day yesterday. Chilling details of a woman's murder that took place two years ago. We'll look at the court and what they have to say about that. On the front page of The Nation this morning, job cuts loom in wage bill review, more or less the same story um, in terms of what we're looking for. Ruto then tells the doctors, it's a top page, top, you're being unreasonable. 
It's a tragedy for highly educated professionals to make unreasonable, dem demand, unreasonable demands in the face of economic hardship and fiscal um, and fiscal constraints at the expense of legitimate needs of their citizens, President Ruto said yesterday as he maintained a hard-line stance against the ongoing national doctor strike. That's on the back page of The Nation. The creme de la creme of school drama festival set for a state concert today. They did a fantastic job and they're making their way to the hill to perform for um, the president at State Lodge in Sagana in Yeri County. So that will be interesting to see. Gashagwa moves to take care, or rather take charge of UDA polls. All right. And uh, alerts. Kindiki issues floods. Warning as heavy rains pound the country. So those are the, some of the things that we're looking at. We'll look at that in depth. City, what you got? Well, in the business daily, mm. bang in the middle of the paper, something very interesting. Mm. Ruby's Inc's deal to operate national oil in rescue plan. There is this uh, oil distribution company called National Oil Corporation. Uh, it's been struggling, mm -hmm. gasping for air. Mm -hmm. And now oxygen has arrived in the form <laughs> oh, yeah. of the French multinational rubies okay and they are set to become the strategic investor mm -hmm. in the national oil corporation this is aimed at reviving the fortunes of this uh distributing uh, network mm. uh, they've been having problems and not just problems big problems mm. yes what they're now waiting for is the attorney general to assent to this deal because national oil is actually owned by Z. The no. government. Exactly. Mm. Then revealed 14 billion. Yeah, this one is interesting. There is um, a cement company called Savannah. Yeah. Now, this Savannah cement got money from two huge banks mm. KCB and ABSA. Mm. Okay. Mm. But it's being said that there's a bit of a problem, a spot of bothers, I would say. Mm. A KCB Group and ABSA are facing a 14 point one two billion hit in the loss making savannah cement they're not making money they put their money into it essentially yes, kcb gave them 8.89 billion mm -hmm. absa gave them 5.23 billion mm. now if it isn't doing well it means the money that they give them is not doing it's well. also not doing well yes there's that little detail mm -hmm. okay then high airport taxes fees slowing down air travel in africa okay mm. looks like we in africa we charge people through the teeth very expensive kenya has costliest fuel in east africa despite latest price cuts more university to lease 1500 acres they say the university of moi moi university is cash trapped mm. so it's opened up 1500 acres to lease so that people can farm and so that they can earn ma money money okay. all right mm. uk firm gets nod to mine manganese there is a uk firm called marula mining and has been awarded a kenyan trading and mining license for manganese paving the way for the company to start commercial mining in samburu county okay. details of this will follow because the question always is yes the community from whence this particular mining operation is now taking place how will they benefit from all this because mm. the manganese is not is within their land eh? How do they benefit? How do they benefit from it? Isn't that always, always been the question? It's always the question because, yeah. yes, the mining and everything is all good and well, but how do they benefit? Yeah. Okay, the star. Mm. Top right hand corner in teal green. Raila to chair top party organ meeting ahead of grassroots polls. Okay. Okay. Then, radical law to tame rogue traffic officers. Mm -hmm. Tough times await corrupt traffic police officers. Should have proposed law seeking to nip the, in the bud the vice sail through. MPs are considering a law which among others seeks to confine the operators to of traffic officers to designated areas where they will be under constant surveillance. Mm -hmm. This won't help, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> but, you know, we can try. Uh, yeah, it won't. Okay. Doctors ordered to resume work pending stalled talks. This is a high court ruling said, guys, stop this. Serikali, you've court order, meet, talk. And this thing of sucking people, forget stop it. Stop it. Forget it. Mm. Meet them, talk, come to an understanding. Bang in the middle of the paper, mm -hmm. cost. Kenya spends 1.1 trillion of ordinary revenue on wages and salaries. 
Yesterday, there was an article which indicated that in the last three years, we had spent 1.2 trillion on allowances. Mm. Okay? Mm. So we are spending. Hmm? Yeah, spending. Proper. Kabisa. <laughs> Anxiety over jobs in fake papers purge. Okay? We've woken up again. Mm. There's a cycle to it. Every once in a while. It's going to rear its ugly head. Yes, yes, yes. It comes up. Yeah. Presidents have directed state agencies to reduce wages by to required levels by 2027 <coughs> okay mm. all right let's see how this one goes and then of course bang again in the middle of the paper pictures of families that have been marooned because of the what Flooding. floods and this is something that had been foreseen so it is not anything that is new yeah. what will be really new is if we hear of the government or a county government coming up with a plan to mitigate against these raging waters <laughs> isn't that sad that, that's what would be new that would be absolutely new but Sheesh. that it is raining, mm. that it is flooding, and that people, homes have been submerged, that is not new. Mm. It's unfortunate, but it's not new. Yep. Okay. Well, all right then. Let's take a break. Let's see what's happening on the roads as we've gotten uh, through about half an hour. Um, and then we'll come back and look at some of these stories. There's a story here about the Tower of Babel. Babel, Babel. Um, and people are babbling at this point. Uh, we'll look at that as well. And this is the one about Bungay Towers. But okay, that'll come in a minute. Let's take a look at the roads, come back and look into some of these stories in depth. This is one of the hottest show that we can ever miss in the morning and it's a show that really gives a real situation in the situation room. Pleasure to be here. Mm. Thank you guys so much. Do that. Nice meeting you. Yeah. You've been beautiful in uh, person more than in yeah. photos. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Corrupter is like pregnancy, you cannot hide it. You know, people are hiding here and there, you know, but after two, three months, five months, now you know. Oh, so that is why the attitude that you are showing us, <laughs> you're pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> It's like what my grandmother would say, mm. cannot pickpocket a naked man. <laughs> How's that? It's communal. Okay, so not much changed uh, in a short while, just at the tunnel on the thicker superhighway coming through towards Pangani. Um, that's where there is some traffic. Most parts of the city today, you're getting in and out, at least at this time, uh, without uh, any hiccups whatsoever. You're looking good coming off Limuru Road and also seeing that no traffic on Waiakue. James Gishuru yet to build up. That will happen later from what we can see. And that's coming in creep through on Riara Road this morning, coming in from Gong Road, um, just a little bit at that junction, Naivasha Road touching on Gong Road, heading towards Riara, or heading down Gong Road into the city. We're going to keep an eye on this and see what happens as we're getting into Thursday. Um, we're seeing a little bit of movement on Langata Road, and that's heading out towards Rila Odinga, with the rest of that going through towards Aerodrome, and then touching on the Nyayo Stadium roundabout out towards Haile Selassie. Okay, we'll keep an eye on things. Mombasa Road looks good. It's been looking good for a while. Uh, let's see what happens as we get to it. Remember but you see a fl it doesn't matter where you are in the country today pools of water please do not attempt because we do not know how deep they are there's your warning for the day we'll talk on spice of mk eon x hashtag the situation room mature intelligent talk every morning spice up yourself mornings done right 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. My goodness, there's so many, many, many things happening. But let's look at the this conference that then that took place over the last couple of days that then brought and we saw the culmination of all of this in some of the decrees that were made. Right, certain things were said. First of all, civil servant jobs in uh, civil servant jobs to go in wage bill cuts. Now, there's a particular cadre of civil servants who will go first. Those ones who have fake academic papers will go first. <laughs> what I'm confused about is when they say, everybody with fake certificates, you go first. Are you supposed to come forward and say, I'm one of them? Or like, how does it happen? Or how do we then ascertain that your certificate indeed is fake? Or do we know this all along, but we've been covering you? What is it going to be? 
But either and, way, those and, ones. And what is it that's going to be the determining factor? That it is fake. Yes. Mm. Well, Are you going to go and do like an audit? Are you going to go to the supposed school where you would have attended? And then they say that you did not attend, or how? Or are you saying that you went to an institution which doesn't exist? Exist, yeah, mm -hmm. a non-existent, or you went to the University of My Sofa? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, whatever which one? It is. Whatever yes. it is. Oh, or University of My River Road. Of My River. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it going to be? And I, for me, what is very comical about all of this is that so one of two things: you either know that these individuals are there with fake papers and that you've been going through with it. Or suddenly, epiphany. What is that eureka moment where you realize, ah, these guys, are, we are trying to reduce the money we are spending and we are paying people who are not even qualified for the position and they lied to us. Well, a number of things. Jobs on the line. All public employees with fake certificates to resign by the end of this year, 2024. Just, okay, that's it. If you know you have a fake certificate, resign. We'll not ask you any questions. We'll just accept your resignation and sayonara. 35% state agencies to cut wage bill to 35% of revenue by June 30th, 2028. No matter what, do what you need to do. Is We just need to know that that wage bill is going to drop from the 47-44 right now and it's going to come down to 35. 2025 is the year that all institutions at both levels of government will migrate their payrolls to the human resource information system. Um... Um, and that's by June 30th. You know, that's next year. Yes, it is. It's a year and two months away. So, you know, chop, chop. President William Ruto said this. Good people, we must just do what we must do. And, to, and for your information, I intend to do it. I'm not quite sure what he intends to do, but okay. And I am ready to take the consequences. My name is Zakayo, and there is no problem. If the country is going to get where we want it to go, I don't mind the names, as long as we get the country where it should go. They've also talked about the fact that they will rationalize staff numbers to align to fiscal sustainability, and they will adopt performance contracting from July the 3rd, 2024. The story goes into more detail on page 10, uh, looking at some of the things that were said. But those are the things that jump out at us when we hear that they will face the acts by december this year if you have a fake certificate um the conference of course was um, organized by the salaries and remuneration commission and the intergovernmental relations technical committee under the name towards 35 percent the president also committed to reduce the current wage bill he said that uh, there was significant progress in managing the public wage bill okay and uh, highlighting its reduction from 81 percent to 46 percent and that's been over time i remember when we spoke with the src uh, chair she did talk about that you know it's been reduced significantly but it's not where we want it to be ruto said increasing the country's revenue will improve the wage bill to revenue ratio i believe that we can raise an extra 500 billion shillings if not one trillion just by digitizing the kenya revenue authority it emerged that civil servants with fake academic papers will be the first on the chopping board ruto said an audit revealed 2,100 civil servants with fake certificates, a testament to corruption in government. Now, just wait for me, hold on. You've done an audit. You realize that 2,100 people with fake certificates are serving in government. Why are they still there? That's my question. I, I don't understand. Why are they still there? And you've actually done that you've opened up the arena of possibilities and you've said, okay, well, we're going to give you a little bit longer. Let's say prick your conscience to then resign by December 2024. I mean, I don't understand. These people came and told you they have one, two, three. You realize that they do not, but they still continue working. How, in what alternate universe is this even possible? How does that work? I don't get it. You know, the... Um this sounds like it's something new and it's something that this particular government has come up with. It's not new. Structural adjustment programs were here in the 1980s and 1990s. Mm. Again, it was IMF, World Bank coming up and saying, guys, you have a bloated workforce and you need to trim it. And it saw the beginning of what they call the golden handshake. <laughs> Civil servants, people in parastatals were being offered an opportunity to get a certain amount of money to retire or to resign. Mm. Now, the net result of that was that very middle-level middle workers within parastatals, government resigned. Yeah. Now, in the intervening years, what then happened was that 
as those who had been at the helm started retiring, there was a gap. Mm. Because many of the so-called middle level who are supposed to have now gone into those positions, many of them had already left employment. Mm. When you see something of this sort happening, and it's something that is coming like an avalanche, rest assured that the people who've been lending us money are putting the squeeze. I get it, CT, but this is my question. I, 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 I don't think that the powers that be are all internal. I do agree that there's external influence here. Let's just do 50,000 shillings. That the 2,100, not 201, not 210, 2,100 employees, fake papers, fake certificates. They continue to work. And you're still saying that we're going to give you until the end of the year for you to resign. Okay? Let's assume that those 2,100 people with fake certificates are earning 50,000 shillings a month. We know that there are some who are earning more. That is 105 million shillings every month that is being paid 105 million every month in just salary we're not talking about allowances we're not talking about traveling to Russia to discuss we're not talking about any of those things just your salary if you're on the lower side being paid 50k and what we're saying is okay we're going to coddle you a little bit more and we're going to give you an opportunity to resign in December come on what kind of acceptance of mediocrity is going on? And we say, okay, yes, well, we realize, but we're just going to stay with it because, you know, we don't want to ruffle any feathers anymore than we already have. That's why you were saying, even this thing that they were talking about, 2028, 2025, not going to happen. The thing is, this is what was likely to happen once we got into the same bed with IMF and World Bank. Yes, because they lend you money with what we call conditionalities. They're the ones who actually introduce this word conditionalities. Yeah. Okay, so it's not just conditions, it's conditionalities. You will get money, yes. But the understanding is that we will give you money so long as you do the following. Okay? Mm. It is along those same lines that the government of Kenya, at that time, point in time, the late and former president, Daniel Rabmoy, was president. They were also asked to sell off government they said this thing of housing people what do you mean housing people mm. How, those, these assets sell now that opened a pandora's box of enormous proportions yeah it ushered in a completely new era of things untold and things unsavory and things which have bedeviled and bothered us to date mm. okay this issue of borrowing money from people who will tell you what they think is good for you. Why? Because you seem to have proved to them that you are unable to do these things on your own. You can't think so, th so they're going to prescribe for you. Yeah. Okay? Mm. Now, whether the government and how the government is going to go about this, this is a wait and see <laughs> situation. My goodness. Okay? But let me tell you, mm. untold suffering is awaiting people. Because the moment you bring this sort of thing in, which hunting will also take place? Mm. Who is the person, who are the people who are going to be at the helm of determining whose papers are fake or not? That's what I'm saying. How are they going <laughs> to... There, there are ways of determining it, by the way. So we have a qualifications authority. Mm. There are ways of determining it. That is, isn't really... In, in the name of the Public Service Commission? Yes. Yeah. The qualification authority exists. It is not difficult to determine whether the papers somebody has are actually genuine or not. It's not difficult. However, however, are we certain that these are the only people who are going to be asked, who are going to be asked to leave? Or is this going to be an opportunity for people to actually pay back for whatever it is? The truth of the matter is, when such a door is opened, apart from what was intended, very many other things will now take place. Huh? Mm? Mm -hmm. mm. Doesn't look good. Yes, it's true. Look, when you open the door for one thing to come in and you've left the door open for a period of time, you will not be able to control whatever else comes in as well or whatever else flies out. That's it. But the intent of opening the door, we never know. And here it is. It's going to play out like that. What else do you have, CT? Well... Mm, mm, mm. You see that same story mm. is not just it is in the star anxiety over jobs in fake papers purge mm. it is in the nation job cuts loom in wage bill review mm -hmm. it is in the standard civil service jobs to go on wage bill cuts so all the three papers in mm. the country major papers have it as a headline yeah all right 
So we are looking at very interesting times because remember, all these 2,100 people you speak of, mm. they represent families, okay? So you are saying that you are going to have a large number of people who are now going to be out of a job. Yep. Is, that, is that not it? Yeah. All right, let's wait and see how this pans out. Right. There's a story that I wanted to talk about. Mm. Where is this story? Oi. Mm -hmm. Call it, call it. Right. Radical law to tame rogue traffic officers. This particular article, I found it interesting. Bill seeks uh, pocketless uniform, CCTV at traffic stops and wealth declaration. Pocketless uniform? Yes. Okay. Ah, okay. Please carry on. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Tough times await the bribe thirsty traffic uh, police officers should a proposed law seeking to nip in the bud the vice sail through pa in parliament. Mm. MPs are considering a law which, among mm. others, seeks to confine the operations of traffic officers to designated areas where they will under be under constant surveillance. By whom? The Bribery Bill 2024, sponsored by nominated MP Obadiah Baronga, mm. is before the National Assembly Administration and Internal Affairs Committee. It proposes the designated areas be under CCTV surveillance. The Inspector General shall zone all areas that traffic police officers are designated and coordinate the installation of CCTV cameras in all areas that traffic police are situated. The legislative proposals read, The Inspector General shall ensure the CCTV cameras at designated traffic areas are maintained. Really? Mm. Okay. This is going to curb what they said? Uh, bribery. Oh, okay. I don't see it, but okay. It's good to say things, I guess. No, no, no. It's not just good to say things. It's good to have laws. <laughs> Even if the law may not achieve what is required at the very onset, that it exists is a good thing. Indeed. Because you then have at least a platform from which you can then say, okay, because of this law, we can now take certain actions if we feel that one has actually gone contrary to whatever, but the law exists. So it is possible to go contrary to the law, and it's, or it's able to, uh, we're able to charge you. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, okay. So but, it's but, good that this law what, comes into. But, yeah. but what I'm actually asking is, you see, it's good to legislate. It's good to have the law, but why is it that bribery is rampant? Simple question. Why is it that the citizens are willing to pay bribes? It's two-way traffic. Why do people willingly pay bribes? Why do they even offer to pay bribes? Mm. Why? See, that's the question you should ask. Because if you're saying, you're thinking that you have CCTV cameras, the law for many people represents an inconvenience. Mm. That's it, an inconvenience. And the only way you go around it is if you offer money. To get what you want or to get yes, out of yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. Or, or to get want. out of it. Or the full brunt of it is lessened when you pay for it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. It's like you get a discount. Okay? So long as we do not look at why it is that we are inclined towards offering bribes and being part of what we call this corruption, because we are part of it. Mm. You are stopped by a policeman, you have a problem. Your tires are more or less bald, and you know very well that that is an offense. Mm. Okay? What do you do? You bribe. Why? So that you don't pay the hefty fine and you don't, you're not taken to court. To court. The inconvenience. How do you ensure that we do not take that shortcut when it comes to ensuring that we circumvent the law because what we as citizens end up doing is we are circumventing the law yes that's true and then the blame seems to be on the policemen they don't bribe themselves we are the <laughs> ones who bribe them yes we are the ones who offer the bribe okay what they offer is to put the law into operation which we consider an inconvenience and to make this inconvenience go away what do we do we offer a bribe but we euphemize it. it's no longer a bribe okay you chai kidogo mm. facilitation kidogo mm. it's a bribe okay and in that process the law is subverted so if you were to bring about a law that then had tighter ropes within which folks would operate then it would act as a deterrent then for that's the theory that's the theory but um i'm not sure about the practice you've heard of the the the, the, the story that's doing the rounds 
that there's this idea that there'll be booths where one can pay fines instantly. Yeah. Do, you, do you know what that'll do? <laughs> there was a time they determined this happened. You'd have a tent, police stop, there'd be a magistrate. I mean, it's instant. You have a problem, you sort it out there and there and there, then done. Yeah, yeah. It was a good thing. How long did it last? Not so long. Okay. Mm. Now, the moment you have a booth, what you've done is you've institutionalized the process of bribery. And then the asking price then will go up. That's what will happen. Mm. We have to address the problem. The problem isn't the bribing. That's the symptom. Why do we prefer to bribe? Why is it that we have a preference for circumventing the law? Where is the hole? Yes, 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 place. yes, yes, yes. That is the issue. But that one, we don't really want to address. That no, problem, not really. We? No. So no. what do you do? Take a little shortcut. Mm -hmm. And let's say we have a new law, okay? Let's have the law. We'll have it. I'm sure at some point it will serve a purpose. Uh, I'm certain. Let's see. I mean, that's good. Yes. It's good for a um, nominated MP over there to mm -hmm. bring this forward. Let's see what happens with it. Yes. Let me tell you this chilling story of a suspect as he narrates the details in a case on serial women murders. Quite chilling, actually. A suspect uh, left the courtroom shell-shocked as he narrated how he murdered one of the four women killed in Mawanga Estate, Nakuru, two years ago. Evan Kebuaro confessed being a member of a gang that robbed women, raped and killed them before setting their house on fire. In a plea bargain deal with the prosecution, Kebuaro laid bare the chilling activities of the gang accused of killing Grace Wanjiko, Susan Wamboy, Beatrice Akini and Diana Opicho. Between December 21st, 2021 and June 24th, 2022, the suspect is, being, is facing a manslaughter charge after pleading guilty to the killing of Wanjiko. Last month, he confessed to killing one boy in another plea deal. The other suspects, Kevin Omondi, Josphat Simio, Julius Omondi, Isaac Kenyanjui, and Dennis Mbolo, face murder charges. While confessing on Monday before Justice Samuel Muchochi, Muhochi of the High Court in Nakuru, Kebuaro explained that on June 14th, 2022, at around 4 p.m., he met another, he met other accomplices and they were working on various construction sites. Kevin informed them of a task that was to be accomplished the following day, but did not give them much detail. They all agreed that they would meet the following day at a play field near Kingdom Seekers Church at around 9 a.m. The journey to Mawanga aboard two motorcycles took 30 minutes. According to him, Kevin directed Simiu and Kinyanjui to engage Wanjiko at an M-Pesa shop. The two introduced themselves as carpenters sent by her mother, Esther and Jockey, who had left for church to repair furniture in their house, which was next to the shop. Gets better. Wanjiko is said to have dismissed them after confirming with her mother through a phone call, but they forced her into the shop to get hold of her. Wanjiko was led to the house where Kevin placed a knife on her throat. He and Mbolo then took her to the main bedroom where they killed her, according to the state witness. Mbolo instructed Julius and Kembora to ransack the shop where they found 2,500 shillings and airtime scratch cards. Once back to the main house, they found Kenyanjui parking a 32-inch TV in a box as Kevin spilled petrol before setting the house on fire. After committing the crime, Kebaro told the court they fled on motorcycles. The gang met at around 5 p.m. in Bondeni and were paid 2,000 shillings. When Jockey received a call from the neighbor saying her house was on fire, she rushed only to find a rescue team at the scene. The government pathologist Titus Ngulungu revealed that the deceased died from strangulation and the body injuries in the private parts. Kebaro was later traced to Kisi through a phone they had stolen from the deceased. That led to the arrest of the others. The case we mentioned on the 19th of April, which is tomorrow. Is this not the clear sign of the effectiveness of the police service? Yep. When they set their mind to doing something, they will get it done. Absolutely. Yes. They will. And it doesn't matter where you think you've gone to, they will find you. Hmm. But this is a worrying trend. Don't this you think is, so? It is. And I was just about to say that, that there's no explanation or justification for ever doing anything like this. But when you ask yourself the question, what would lead five young men to doing something as heinous as this, going, waylaying this young woman, 
raping her. Whom they didn't know. They didn't know her. They lied to her and said one, two, three. Raping her, murdering her, and then setting the house on fire. And what did they get out of it? Two thousand bob. Two thousand five hundred shillings, airtime, and a thirty-two inch TV. You've taken a life. And that was just one of the women. Three, three other women were killed in the same manner. What leads people to do something like this? W what? You know, let me respond by actually giving you an example. Hmm. If you leave the compound of Standard Group here on Mombasa Road, mm. there's this road that passes by um, GM, along GM and so forth. Mm -hmm. There is a corner right over there mm. where people are always being marked. Mm. Okay? Mm. Some people have been killed. Now, the people perpetrating this, mm. we know because when you talk to the security people not very long ago, mm. some, a group, again, of young men yeah. tried to waylay somebody in that same corner. Mm. Unfortunately for them, there were Matatus passing by. Now, one Matatu crew stopped. And intervened yeah okay yeah and I am told those young men got burnt mm. mob justice burnt yeah okay yeah now young men mm. what is it that is driving because it's young people young people mm. to get into groups because the question that you then ask when they in the right state of mind yeah had they ingested had they partaken of any mind-altering substances because by the time you have that herd mentality and you've all agreed you're going to do this are you are you really in your are you under some influence mm. that is a question and why go through this and when, by the time someone is running away and hiding it means they know what they've done is wrong they know absolutely yes well, they have to take off to another place where you're unknown yes you know what you've done is wrong they know so when they're doing it, they don't know it's wrong. So what is it that makes them do what they do and commit these heinous crimes? I know. And plan it. And every day, if we choose to, there will be a story in the papers mm. where something equally heinous has happened. And it happens every single day. We've asked the government to declare mental health in this country a national disaster. Just like we talk about climate change consequences and yeah. so forth. This... Yeah is a problem it's and a it's a very big problem mm. but we're glossing over it are we still uncomfortable having this conversation because you know mental illness is an ill it's an illness it, it is, is an a illness it is a disease yes it is but up until now you know in my we just we, we don't really talk about it because it seems in the realm of taboo even in my language, we say Ndiala, the, the, those ones who are not all right. And that's how we, 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 you want to see somebody in the street with their clothes off for you to deem that this person yes, is Yes, yes, talking to themselves. Yes, and, yes, and, that's and, the only yes. mental no. illness that we speak of. No, no. The character of it has really morphed over the years. That mental health, is, mental uh, disease is, it's dressed up in a suit and driving a fancy car. Yes, yes it, it is. is. Yeah. Yes, when are we going to address this issue? And all these young people we're talking about, many of them have completed school. Mm. A good number of them have even gone to tertiary colleges. Some have even gone to university. But they seem to have nothing else to do other than this. Because are you telling me that someone who is gainfully engaged is also going to do, as a part-time, look for ways of mugging women and strangling women? No. Come on. Without question. For that sort of thought process to take root, you don't have very much to occupy yourself with, do you? Mm. No. No. We're waiting for it to walk up and slap us in the face in a very serious way before actually um, some attention is paid to it and it needs to happen. But it needs. It, it. No, it's, it's slapping us in the face because Already. when you see our own lawmakers ignoring things that ought to be for the common good and instead heading in the complete opposite direction of what they should be, are we then saying that we don't have a mental health problem in this country? Oh, I almost say that some of them could be affected as well. Yes. The president of the LSK will be in the hot seat at 7 o'clock. We'll have that conversation as we wrap things up. Good morning. It's 7 a.m. Spice up your life.
Health says Susan Nahumicha told the Senate that the process to have a health service commission is not her ministry's mandate, but it would be great to have one. Health unions have been fighting for the creation of the commission, saying it will be a lasting solution to all problems facing the health sector. But Nahumicha said to achieve that it would require constitutional review. Nahumicha also assured the NHIF beneficiaries that they'll continue to receive medical services until the Social Health Insurance Fund, SHIV, is rolled out. The services that are being provided will continue to the time that then Social Health Authority takes over from NHIF. That one thing that the Transitional Committee is ensuring is that the Kenyan should not actually notice that there has been a change from NHIF to Social Health Authority. Mindoral President William Ruto has called out leaders supporting the doctor's strike Arguing that they are chasing popularity among Kenyans, President Ruto stated that the leaders championing the medics goes law should go ahead and pay them the dues they are demanding. He went on to intimate that the country has much bigger problems to address at the moment. The other day, we have a doctor's challenge. You can hardly pay because we've said, you know, there, there are real issues we want to deal with. You have leaders who each is in their place, including governors, saying we support the, the doctor's strike. Really? If you support the doctor's strike, pay, pay the money they're asking for. I mean, so we must stop chasing what is popular. We must go after what is right. Interior CS Kitharuki Niki has warned Kenyans that low that low-lying areas and those along lakes and rivers and could experience flooding because of heavy rains in western Kenya communities along lakes and rivers in Homo Bay, Siaya, Busia, Nyando, Nyakacha and Moroni are likely to experience flooding. Low-lying areas in Migori, Kakamega and Vega also risk flooding if the quantity of precipitation increases beyond the prevailing levels. Meanwhile, more than 6,300 people in Nyanza have been affected by floods so far. Flora Morora is the regional commissioner. We have 1,000 households that have been uh, displaced and also we have 6,302 people who have been affected. By that I mean they may not have been um, displaced from their homes but they are there struggling with, with the water. For Kisumu, the most affected uh, sub-counties are Nyando and Kadibo. In Migori, there is Nyatike. And President William Ruto has asked individuals who secure and government jobs using fake academic certificates that they should refund the money and in salaries. We will now confront the monster corruption head on going forward. Whether it is in counties, whether it is in the national government, just imagine a simple audit of people working for government has revealed that we have 2,100 so far people with fake certificates working for government. And just a simple audit. And from this conference, Madam Chair, I hope we are going to add one more resolution on fake certificates. Those who have earned money using fake certificates should refund us our public money. At the same time, Deputy President Rugat Gachago alleged that he has a list of senior government officials who hold fake degrees. He said he got it from River Road. Nairobi. What wengi wako kwa serikali, wengine magavana, wengine heads of department, makaratasi yao yuko dosari. Na unajua mimi mimi sitaki kwenda hiyo barabara ya kwenda river route. Mimi natosheka na ile kidogo niko nayo. So when I've been complaining that I'm feeling lonely at the top because my boss has 3 degrees, mimi niko na kamoja. So hii watu ya river road wamekuwa kinitafuta. Nasema sasa wewe naibu wa rais unalalamika nini? Tumesaidia watu wengi. Rais hawa list hiyo nitakupatia ile nimepewa ya wale wamesaidika. In Tanzania County, Governor George Natemba has criticized the recent meeting between National Assembly Speaker Moses Zutangula and Deputy President Rugadhi Gachagwa. Natemba is leading a political rebellion movement in Western Kenya dubbed Tawe. Kenya Musima Sasa in the Leo Kwamba, Sisi Kama Jamia Magaribi, Abuja Pata Yetu Penele Meza Bugo, Kunawata Mbo Mepo and Azoya Sisi Leo. Sasa Wanangaika, Wanangaika, Mimi Nafrai in a checker. Wanaita watu kuja kunitukana hapa, hakuna matusi, inaweza kusimamisha kama mwamba ata kuzaa mtoto. Hata ukileta wanaume wa shike na mnagani. Ye nama lazima itoke, zinio? Sisi tumezema hata mkifanya nini, mambo ni tawe. Mambo ni tawe. I'm Dennis Aseta, good morning. Traffic, traffic on, vibe, on vibe Radio. Spice FM, Nakuru. 
Okay, so where are we this morning? Traffic up and about in the city. Is that where you're going today? Um, inbound to the city coming off a thicker superhighway. Not too bad, actually. We're looking at a little bit of it here and there um, around the Pangani underpass. It's going to take us out for some time. And then now is when we actually start to see the build-up um, getting in from Waiakiwe. James Gishiro is also busy as you get towards Waiakiwe. Nothing happening on the Red Hill Link Road for now. In and outbound traffic um, is moving. And also then coming in from Westlands, Ring Road Westlands, starting to pass up a little bit as well and Langata Road also started to do the business earlier but I think we're going to be able to get through without too much of an issue all right um, coming off of Jago Road is touching in from Manyanja all of this coming off of Outer Ring and then North Airport Road coming in from Cabanas going towards the Eastern Bypass has a little bit here and there but okay Thursday morning not looking too terrible in the city this morning other parts of the country we assume everything is going well if it's not will you tell us let's talk on Spice FMKE on X hashtag the Situation Room This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, Pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room. It is the, the only, only way to start, to start your day. It's after 7 o'clock. On this 18th day of April, the Situation Room gets into its second hour this morning. And welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation. All right. We're getting into a um, uh, conversation with the new president of the Law Society of Kenya. She is here. But before we do that, what's your plan? And that's the question we're going to ask. What is your plan? Do you have one? Are you thinking of putting one together? Well, the good folks at ICEA Lion are saying, we know that you may be thinking of it. How about you come on down and let us have a conversation about that? Get online and see what we have in store plan.icealion.co.ke that's plan at icealion.co.ke or you can send an email plan at icealion.co.ke let folks know that this is what you're thinking this is what you'd like to do and they'll put it together for you and bring those plans into reality so your plan in whatever color for however long you want it to be that is what we are talking about with your plans at I C E A Lion. All right. So the last time she was here, she was not president. Today, she is. Faith Odhiambo is the president of the Law Society of Kenya. Madam President, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Very good to see you. Good to see you as well. I, I want to say that you look different, but you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just that now you have a, a new title. Your smile might just be slightly broader. <laughs> yes, nothing has changed really. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Good to see you all the same. And Karibu Sana. Asante. Uh, in the hot seat this morning. Um, this week, CT went to Cape Verde. That's where the proverbs are from this week, and he has a very interesting one today. Uh, over to you, CT. You can tell us what you think about it. Okay. Uh, the day's proverb from Cabo Verde. That's Cape Verde in Portuguese. An aging man gets closer to his land, and an aging husband gets closer to his wife. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I think it's more of going back to the roots. Yes. Um, as time, as you grow older, you understand the importance of home and uh, of giving back to the society. And I think as an aging man back to his wife, I, I, or closer to his wife, I'd say that you realize options are limited. Now. <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather stay with the one that you are. <laughs> with um, Cape Verde is a beautiful um, small country but a beautiful one so I think that proverb is quite befitting 
I would say that as time goes by, even if you look at it in a broader perspective, as we grow older, we realize the importance of our nation, of our country, mm. of just protecting um, what we have for the future generation. Um, and that's why I would say you go back to your roots. Mm. You remember what's important. We had uh, frolics when you're younger. As you grow older, you mm. realize, um, let's go back to where we started. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. So, I mean, many things are happening. Of course, we'd like to see what you, it is that would happen, would, you'd like to do with LSK as we go into you know, the next year or so. But uh, let's look at LSK right now in line with what is happening around the country at the moment. One of the big things is, this, is, the, is the doctor's strike um, and legalities or illegalities and saying that, well, here's a body that um, is tasked with a number of things in society today. And if we talk about legalities and illegalities, let's just kick off with some of the issues that we are seeing currently um, in the country and uh, maybe hear what role then the LSK would play in all of this and what is seen in terms of what is happening at the moment? I would say that what we are seeing right now is the doctors are fighting for what they believe is their rights under the CBA that they last signed vis-a-vis mm. -vis the question of um, whether their right to strike is beyond uh, right of essential services and I would say you balance it to what extent. Mm. Um, we have a country that is saying they don't have money for doctors, but they have money to increase mm. um, the salaries of members of parliament. They mm. have money to increase the budget mm -hmm. allocation of the second, uh, I, would say, I would say the DP's wife or the second mm -hmm. lady of the nation, mm. which is not even a constitutional office. So you create an office, um, then by virtue of the fact that you hold majority in parliament, mm -hmm. you push for it, then again you allocate a budget to it, and then you increase the budget. And I feel it's quite immoral if you even look at the kinds of the amounts that have since been added, particularly for the second lady. Mm. And then you tell us you don't have money to pay our doctors who provide basic essential services for this nation. Yeah, And so I, I would say it's a screwed... Uh, or skewed way of how we look at things and secondly we have now the council of governors saying on their end they didn't sign the cba and further they can't afford to pay for that cba in any event mm. um they are complaining also of how much they are getting from um, the national government but this question all also goes vis-a-vis -vis the question of the kind of corruption that is happening at the county so the question is what is more important, um, paying for essential services, ensuring your people have basic health care, mm. or the other activities that you're running? Then we have also the question from the national government that you cannot ping pong it and say this is the role of the counties. And I would say tongue in cheek because now we look at the housing mm -hmm. levy and what's going on. It's essentially the role of the counties for housing under the constitution mm -hmm. but the national government has taken over it and they signed that cba and i think they have to honor it or they ought to honor it for the people of kenya because as much as you say that it's important to house every kenyan how much important it is to ensure that your kenyans have basic health care mm -hmm. that they're able to live and survive on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. so in the nation that we live in it's only important if it's their priority mm. And I believe what the doctors are doing, I stand uh, totally in support because they're also fighting for the future of the doctors to come. Because if you're having doctors that are not even getting internships, getting paid for those internships, how can you say that you must go and offer essential services if you cannot even break, um, pay for your bread and butter on a day-to-day -day basis? So to what extent you're forcing me to offer these services and I'm not able to make it on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you also question the interns that have gone through school. Yeah. When will they get through that training to be able to make it for the next doctors? Because as a nation, there has to be some planning mm. that we know that these are the next cohort of doctors that are coming up and the population is growing. So you cannot tell us that we have enough doctors mm. in this nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Where does this all fall? Because we've had... I mean, we read an article this morning about, you know, um, court saying 
all of you need to sit at the table we are now giving an order whereby you sit at the table have this conversation we have heard from the ig of police that you know what these demonstrations that you're doing we don't want these nuisances around the city or around the towns where these are happening we don't want that uh, we've heard from the cs that uh, you know first of all um, the court uh, has said that these kind of strikes are illegal how does the law the law now play when all of this and we're now saying the law vis-a-vis -vis rights that people have done been used that people are using actually to say this is the reason why you should go back to work well I'll, I'll, let me start with the law um well i agree that court orders should be obeyed and uh by if the dinged of the courts is that they're illegal then then they should still appeal for that decision to allow them to go on strike but vis-a-vis -vis the rights of the doctors, it's um, enshrined in the Constitution. You have the right to association under Article 36, uh, freedom and uh, right to picket peacefully, of course, under Article 37. And I, I would say that what the doctors, they're enjoying their rights and they ought to be allowed to express themselves. Mm -hmm. Vis-a-vis -vis, um, them sitting at the table, I agree they ought to sit at the table. And that's why I don't agree with some of the nuances and the hard stances that have been taken with the Council of Governors. Because if they, you know, when two bulls are fighting, it's the grass that, you know, feels mm. the pinch. Mm. So it's the, if you go to the public hospitals and just somebody needs to do a survey of how many deaths or um, in complications are developing over time because there's no adequate number of doctors to be able to offer services mm -hmm. to the people that are piling in those hospitals. Mm -hmm. How many lives are we losing on a day-to-day -day basis? And so the reality is as they fight, the question is who is hurting the most? We need to think about the greater good and think about the people of Kenya. And that's why the Council of Governors need to come down and sit and talk to mm -hmm. these doctors. Mm -hmm. Because until you see the dire situations that some of them end up having is when you realize also they are human beings and they're going through challenges and struggles. Then we have the CS as well. I think she needs to get off her high horse and sit down and talk to the doctors mm. and try and agree on a way forward. Because... It is highly immoral, I would say, that you signed, those are CBA signed by the government. Then you say, now we are not going to be able to uh, live up to that CBA. You're not even trying to negotiate. And they had got, the doctors had agreed to, um, to go back to work after they signed that initial CBA. You have not made attempts to, uh, um, you know, live up to that collective bargaining agreement. Now you're telling them, we, c we will not honor it, we cannot honor it, go back to work. Mm. There is absolutely no goodwill. And I think both, even the doctors need to tone down a bit, maybe on their hard stances, let them sit together and agree on possibly how they implement that mm -hmm. CBA. Mm -hmm. It's only fair that we also ensure that they are paid well, but at the same time, we cannot have hard stances at the backstop of what is happening in our nation. Mm -hmm. You cannot say there's no money. There's no money, but there's money for other things. So mm -hmm. the question is, is healthcare not part and parcel of the important things? Mm -hmm. With regards to the IG, I ask myself, what is his interest? The office of the IG should be an independent office to offer services to the people of Kenya. The doctors, once they issue an, a notice, I'm requesting to go on uh, to express themselves and strike i don't understand what is his um interest in getting involved in this um, dispute because he's not a court he cannot limit the right to strike of doctors mm -hmm. unless you he would say that there's evidence that they have been um, causing chaos so using vuvuzelas does not amount to the standard that he should um, ask his officers to use any kind of force upon the doctors. He, he cannot assume the role of arbiter of the courts to try and give direction and say, you will not go on strike, I will not allow this, I will not allow this. What is your interest? Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be an independent office. You're not supposed to join the side of the executive. And that's the challenges that Kenyans have faced over time, and that's why we thought finally you'd have an office of the IG that is independent under the Constitution. But he continues to disappoint 
time over time by failing to exercise some level of um, independence. So are, you, are you saying essentially that uh, the IG then may be on, on puppet strings? Is somebody asking him to make these statements? We, that's, that's the hard question that we are asking him. Because you cannot enter into a dispute that you're not involved in. The question is, to what extent has your powers been evoked? Or, you know, you would say that the doctors have engaged in d destroying property or something like that. Then you'd say, I, as the IG, am moving in to protect the members of the public. His responsibility as well is not only to protect the members of the public, but once a notice to strike has been issued, he ought to provide security. The doctors have shown evidence of goons being brought to mm. disrupt um, their strike. Why aren't you providing security for those doctors to, you know, exercise their right to strike peacefully? They are not harming anyone. They are not affecting anyone except traffic. But of course, we have seen strikes in this nation before and traffic is obviously affected. Mm -hmm. But as long as the doctors have not destroyed anyone's property, they are not harming anyone physically. On what basis, what is your interest mm. in that strike? And that is the hard question. And we've seen, seen um, Katiba has gone to court and gotten orders seeking a stay of his purported directive. And I hope that he will take it seriously and obey those court orders. Mm. Yeah. But, we, but we have a problem here. All these independent offices that were created were created so that they would actually be independent. But before we get to the independent offices, let's go to Parliament. They have a constitutional role as parliament. They are an arm. They are supposed to ensure that they limit and they check the possible excesses of the executive. Now, if you have a parliament that seems to be dancing to the same tune as the executive, we are done for. Because who is going to check the executive? Because Everything we're saying here seems to point to the executive because who appoints the IG? Now, Parliament is the one place where you can't say they were appointed. These are people who are individually elected all over the country. And yet, we are where we are. Because all these excesses we are speaking of, Parliament have always been in a position to actually intervene. They can. But on matters that are this serious, they're silent. One doesn't hear their voice, or unless they're speaking and it is me who has not heard them speak. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. I'd say the tragedy that we face as a nation, particularly now, is we have a parliament that is pointing its fingers at the judiciary, and we have an executive pointing its fingers at the judiciary yes. as well. Because you see parliament time and time on again overruling or trying to find loopholes to work around court decisions yes. in aid of the uh, executive. Yes. And I would say the problem with parliament that they are not seeing their role as an oversight. I think they're seeing their role as might is right, and we have the numbers, and mm. we will push for everything that works for us. And I think the failure of this parliament, they fail to see the general trajectory of things, how it always happens. Today, you feel like you have majority. Tomorrow, you will lose that majority. And then, then, you'll, and then what? You'll, then what? And then you lose even that um, credibility, mm. even at all, that you'd have had an um, impact. I think as a nation, parliament needs to rethink its role in terms of what, as the heads, the two heads, the speakers of the two houses, guiding their members that at the end of the day, we are supposed to be a check. We're not supposed to be a rubber stamp. What we're seeing more and more is more of a rubber stamp. And I would say that even as a nation, we don't even, we barely see that we even have an opposition. I would say that the challenge, yes, um, the government has the majority in parliament. But I would say that even as opposition, they may be at a disadvantage. But mm -hmm. something that they should be challenged is let them keep providing alternatives so that the record shows um, that and the Halsbury is that they continued to provide different solutions mm -hmm. and they the majority kept opting for this other kind of direction um, it's sad we raise it we complain about it but unless the two heads realize 
um, their important role that they play and how they can guide their members of parliament it's quite unfortunate mm -hmm. we keep seeing i was seeing um, a photo someone was sharing yesterday a member of parliament at watch sleeping peacefully at, at a meeting uh, in a session in parliament why because they have the majority there's nothing to be watchful about mm -hmm. maybe wake up for the time of voting um, and some, and we were watching also the proceedings of the vetting of some of these um, ambassadors and high commission and some of these rejected ones all of a sudden there was so much clamor mm. by some particular ones and the reasons that were being brought were quite interesting. So someone was laughing and saying the power of the brown bag, you can bring all reasons to support mm. and it's, it's unfortunate but that's the kind of mockery. Um, I think it, it may reach a time that we start having, um, we should have a way to bring our members of parliament for questioning on what they ha and to account to us what they have been doing. Um, the reality is, as time goes by, we will, we, 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 what we are saying is like parliament has become an appenditure of the executive. They should be singing to one or reporting as one because what is the trajectory that we have been seeing all through mm -hmm. is that they seem to be singing from one end. Of course, because they have the numbers. Yeah. You know, go ahead. The, um, if I look at the history of the LSK over time, long before we coined the term civil society, mm. they played that role. And uh, people who were at the helm of the LSK, many of them rose to prominence simply because of the positions they took vis-a-vis -vis the government of the day and the excesses of that particular government. Now, in this day and age, I find that the thing that we keep complaining about with regards to the public understanding, their sovereignty, and what that entails is perhaps a clearer understanding of the law. Now, every time an issue goes to court, it's an opportunity for us to be, to be educated. Yeah. But the LSK, in my opinion, are in a far better position than even the judiciary when it comes to educating the public about their rights. Because right now those in power believe they are in power and they are, but what they don't seem to understand is the temporary nature of these things. None of these things are permanent. They are all temporary. And there are steps that will be taken, there are laws that will be pushed through to serve certain interests. But it serves your interest when you're in a position of power. What happens when you have that same law and you're not in a position of power? It will most certainly work against you, but it will work for that person who is in power. Now, why am I raising this point? Because I'd like you to tell us what it is that you plan to do, what your master plan is as the president of the LSK. Because every person comes in with an idea of what it is they'd like to see. We'd like to know what you would like to see during your tenure. As president now during my tenure as president there are things that I'd promised of course my members that we want to see we want to see a review or revamp with regards to the challenges of corruption that we're seeing in the courts as well as corruption in the lands registry and uh, far, part of also the same is how can we make um, changes to make um, accessibility to courts and also at the lands office to members of the public as well as our members because if we are having challenges as advocates you can imagine the challenges that laymen are having but what difference as well that we want to do is i want to try and work closer with our members of parliament to offer alternatives particularly to try and review some of these laws and policies mm -hmm. and raise hue and cry to some of them because if you saw the colors nature even some of the final when the finance bill was shared and uh, the members of parliament passed it later on they'd say that that bill was too big they were not able to read it the entire bill we want to work closely with them to keep offering an alternative voice um, to be able to share and also try and educate as much as we can particularly some of the bills that will affect members of the public most and we don't want to wait just until the time it's become an act that we go to court and trying to challenge the provisions, but we want to try and work with them closely as they develop some of these laws and policies to also raise concern that some who may not catch 
um, the loopholes um, and the gaping challenges that may thereafter arise, law society can try and support with that regard. Mm. Um, because at the end of the day, yes, we have a lot of our members there and we want to remind them that first they are lawyers and they have a responsibility um, to also serve members of the public. And as part of also the legal profession, they have a responsibility. Um, they answer also to the Law Society of Kenya. And so we'd want to work closer with them that we try and arrest some of these problems that we're having in the kind of policies and bills at an inception stage and st and, uh, instead of waiting until they come to become um, law. And we will do our part. I'm not saying that it's going to be perfect and they are going to see eye to eye, but mm. we will offer them that alternative. Mm -hmm. That is most important, that the Law Society has made its intervention. I would say that civic education is quite important. Unfortunately, that role that um, IBC used to take up, IBC no longer does civic education. And we will try our best, but I've realized something is that a majority of people are consumers on social media mm -hmm. and the the reality is unless we work closely with media as well yeah um that will be a challenge in how we are selling and sharing this information sure and the challenge that lsk is thinking of how can we work closely with media and also share information and educate at the simplest terms mm. because what this executive or this government has caught right i believe is how to sell information to the members of the public. Indeed. So by the time you're in court fighting for a dire uh, against a certain directive, law, policy, the feedback that is on the ground of members of the public is that you're fighting the government as an opposition. Members of the public are not consuming the actual harm that will impact by virtue of any change in law and policy they do not understand it because it's been sold already to them on social media yeah. in, a, um, in a manner that evokes emotion i would even say a good example is the housing levy um someone was having a we were having a discussion with friends and mm -hmm. i was telling them the reality is if you listen to the message it's not for you and me the message is for the person in the ground that these people do not want you to own your home. Mm. You have an opportunity to own a home. So you're evoking that emotion vis-a-vis -vis how do we sell also as we educate members of the public, public in a way that they understand. Let's take a break on that note and come back because I think we can open that up just a little bit more and find out. Okay, so then how do we get, how is it then accessible? LSK here that, you know, previously was seen as maybe how then do these folks come down to this level um so let's open that up a little bit as we take a break the president of the law society of kenya faith Ojambo, is our guest this morning and we're looking into some issues traversing a lot of these illegalities illegalities and we'll be back after we take this short break it's 27 minutes to eight this is the situation room the only way to start your day. Experience the vibrant pulse of Africa at Festac Africa Festival 2024 in Kisumu. Join us for a week-long celebration of culture, music, fashion, and more from May 20th to 26th. Dive into sustainable growth with food, art, and... got a plan to make my investment seem better than I do under the shower. ICEA Lion has a plan for everyone. Talk to us today for a plan that's right for you. Or visit icealion.co.ke. ICEA Lion, what's your plan? Attention to all the fun-loving children out there. It's time for the Club Kiboko Family Fun Day. This year, it is bigger, better, and we have lined up a day out for the whole family where kids can run around while parents get to relive fun childhood memories all over again. 
From great entertainment, food and games ranging from quad biking, virtual reality, PlayStation competitions, trampolines, horse riding and more, you better be ready. And for the parents, we haven't left out that little child in you too. You're in for fun rounds of Kati, Blada, Bano, Roundas, Karaoke and even our very own cooking competition. So bring your kids and join in on the fun too at the Ulinzi Sports Complex on Saturday 27th of April. Head over to tickethub.co.ke or ticketsasa.com today and purchase your tickets at 500 shillings for kids and 300 shillings for adults. Come let loose and have the time of your lives at the Club Kiboko Family Fun Day. The weather with Spice FM. Sunny conditions are partly cloudy in some parts of Nairobi. We'll see highs of 25 and lows of 15 at 27. That will be the high in a sunny Nakuru. And it's 16 and sunny in um, Nyeri with highs of 26. And looking into a partly sunny Eldoret at 14, we'll see highs of 26. Mombasa is cloudy at 25 with highs of 29. And Malindi this morning is sunny at 26 with highs of 29. At 21, Kisumu is sunny, highs of 30. And we'll see highs of 30 in a sunny Kakamega at 19. Light rain showers continue in Kampala with highs of 28 and we're looking into a mostly sunny Dar es Salaam at 24 with highs of 30. It's 12 degrees and mostly sunny in Johannesburg with highs of 22 and we're looking into a sunny Mogadishu at 29 going to highs of 32. At 17 Addis Ababa is sunny with highs of 24 and at 27 it's mostly clear in Lagos going to highs of 34. Kinshasa at 25 is cloudy with highs of 32 and lows of 24. up your life. On the thicker superhighway, just busy as you're coming over that survey drift and then heading out towards the city, but you will not find much more of that uh, traffic as you get into the CBD. It's starting to look a little bit busy on Ngong Road, and as you get towards community and then out towards Haile Selassie at the junction, I think you'll be all right. Um, some traffic on Langata Road, touching a little bit on um, Huru Highway, and then getting through the over that hill uh, down Haile Selassie, and we should be fine. Ngong Road, like we said, not too bad, but if you look up there at Naivasha Road, then heading out towards Riara Road and then on towards James Gishuro out towards Waiaki Way movement happening. Just a little bit of traffic here and there but I think we'll survive it. Thursday doesn't look like it's going to be too difficult with traffic today. We're getting into traffic hour right now. Let's see what happens as we get to the top of the hour. We'll talk on Spice of MKE on X. Hashtag the Situation Room. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. It's in this conversation that we're having with um, LSK President Faith of Yambo. And as we went to the break, um, uh, Faith, asking and saying, look, the law society of Kenya is wrapped up in a lot of, there's a lot of legalese there, um, um, or even actions or activities that the, the society is mandated to perform, right? And so for people who are saying, okay, so it's great, there's a, there's a law society, who is it for? Who is it for? Is it for them? Is it a legal club where all advocates can just be part of and then every now and then we see them hearing, we hear them saying something? Or... Are there elements of the society that are there then for the benefit of Kenya's people? How then do they access that information, plug into the society, activate some of those roles and mandates that you have for their information and benefit? Um, I would say that the Law Society is there not only for our members as advocates, but also for the members of the public. I would say that just last weekend, I spent both my Saturday and Sunday attending legal aids that were organized by advocates in Embakasi, one organized by advocates in Sitam Church, mm -hmm. and on Sunday um, as well, one organized in Moja too. Um, by free legal services um, by advocates at the church premises. 
and we have eight branches around the country mm -hmm. and if you even see some of the statements we make with regards to challenging um, some of the policies that have been proposed and laws by the executive mm -hmm. is just looking at holistically how it's affecting members of the public mm -hmm. we have um, at our offices a number of members of the public who normally come to just look for legal aid and pro bono legal services to just support um, the challenges particularly those who cannot afford um, a lawyer so we do quite a bit of work mm. for members of the public in line with uh, our role under section 4 under the act mm -hmm. and so LSK is not just there for our members we also work with the government as well um, we our role is to advise so I think something that would want to do particularly with this government is to sit them down and you know share as LSK our challenges it's not just to issue statements against them and for also them to sit down and listen mm -hmm. to the pulse of the people it's high time that um, even as the executive they embrace you know a different voice mm -hmm. It's it's a critic that is positive because we are looking at the work that you're doing and we are working with members of the public and it's high time that you sit down and just listen. It's not just about criticizing you and telling you that you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. When you're right, we will celebrate the government. But when you're wrong, expect us to tell you you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's quite important in a, in a democracy, since you have so many choir members, to sit down and listen to those who are not singing to the same tune of your choir. Because it'll, the critics help you sharpen and improve mm -hmm. um, some of the policies and things that you are seeking to do as government, which is quite important. It's good to look at that outside lens and say, well, LSK is saying no to this, and why are they saying no to this? And maybe what we hope to do is also provide where we can alternative propositions. Because a lot of the challenges that we keep having with government is that we keep identifying where the law you're you know against the law mm -hmm. but instead of sitting down and restructuring and saying well they have highlighted one two three is against the law how do we sit and find ourselves within the law yeah then at that p particular position we would be together would be saying well you're doing the right thing so we will support what you're doing to the best end act as also a check to ensure that this service that you're offering to members of the public is actually affected mm -hmm. um so with regards to members of the public i would say that lsk does quite a bit of work yeah. uh, for members of the public the question is how much can we do um with the limited resources and that's why i'm saying it's quite important that we work closely as well with the media because information is power and information is key and as a nation um, we have quite a litigious uh, nation in kenya we have so many court matters always because once members understand that, uh, members of the public understand their rights, then they're able to quickly take action mm -hmm. with regards to the same. And so what we'd want to do is try and partner to ensure that we have more civic education to help members of the public understand what are their uh, rights and how can we ensure that uh, we work together to ensure that we protect the little that we have under our constitution. Mm. If you look at um, the political arena, anywhere in the world, the battle that always rages is for the heart of the people. That's the battleground. Now this government is a government that the LSK could learn from. Because they focus on visibility and they are very visible. There are those who may smirk and say, but you know, they are, one wants to open a, a dispensary. Yes, it's visibility. One may want to cut a ribbon on a road that was completed, God knows. It's visibility. So every waking day, the public is in touch with the executive every single day. The LSK, we hear of them maybe on a weekend. And even then, we have the time we have no idea what they're talking about. Because by the time they're through with the section, there's an article, this, and it's 221, and you wonder, was it 231 or was it 221? So the public hears you, understands that you're trying to uh, get them to understand something else, but the executive resonate mm -hmm. better because they have understood 
the language that communicates effectively. Now, as we say, it isn't rocket science, but this is something that one can learn. How do you get to communicate legalese in a way that the public can understand it and understand it as something that is beneficial to them? Because the moment you see the benefit, you will move towards it. The idea of owning a house is a lovely idea. Lovely, lovely, lovely. It doesn't matter what people say. It is a wonderful idea. And if it's packaged and it is presented and the picture that is painted in words is like that, you can actually see yourself living in that house. Anybody else who says anything to the contrary, even if you are right, you will not be listened to. It's not complicated. Yeah. Now, the LSK, those of your members, you are referred to as learned friends, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, now that is going to be tested. How learned are you? Because you have members everywhere. You have members in parliament. You think of any sphere of our lives, you have members. Mm. So you cannot say you do not have the resource. The resource that is required is a human resource. You already have it. But then, on the other hand, you have members who represent you badly. When we talk about corruption in the courts, corruption doesn't corrupt itself. There are people, human beings have to participate in it. So there will be members of the judiciary who are inclined towards corruption. There will be people who are your members who are advocates of the High Court, who are inclined, who oil this particular process. And whether we like it or not, it's just something that we've taken as being normal in our country. So depending on the issue I have, I will look for a specific lawyer who is known in the public domain as a bagman for a certain judge. Mm. Now, these are just simple realities that we have. Yeah. How does LSK pull away and show that despite all these things, they have the interest of the public at heart because the interest that they have for their members is expected and is understood. But how does that benefit the public? Well, I would, I would say first of all is the challenge of speaking the people's language. Mm. Um, I would say that some of the greatest judges like Lord Denning, his language style, if you read his decisions, were simple. Very simple English. Nothing complicated, no huge words, no Shakespeare just simple english and the next thing would be now to speak to the hearts of people yeah um it's it's an individual talent i would say that our head of state has an individual talent of how to speak to the hearts not everyone has that ability but i'd say it's a challenge that i've realized watching some of his speeches how he speaks to the hearts and not to the minds of the people and uh, that's a technique that we are picking up and we'll learn from it. Yeah, and I agree with you. We may not have the financial resource, but we have the human resource. Mm. And what LSK wants to do in part and parcel of our agenda in this next two years is also to deal with the question of corruption. Um, not just at the courts, but it's true the challenge that also to look within because when you see a corrupt magistrate or judge there has to be somebody who was involved in that transaction mm. and the beauty i always say is that in that transaction there is always the opposite party who didn't get justice and so they'll be able to identify and complain not only about that magistrate or judge but the lawyer that was involved in that transaction mm. a challenge that we have had is how to make our disciplinary process um, more public explain to the members of the public make it more robust and uh, ensure members of our, the public understand how can they get justice in event that a lawyer who is corrupt um, defrauds you so that they also are aware um, may, we, may ways and means that they can ensure that they get justice against any corruption that um, may have go, they may have faced um, involving an advocate because we have to agree that we also have to look within and clean within other than just pointing fingers and that's something that we're ready to do i pick up the challenge and uh, those are something that we'll be working on to ensure that we try and reach out as much as possible and the challenge that i will continue giving our members particularly those in parliament even in the executive because we have quite a number of members mm -hmm. even in executive but i think the moment you get a position of power you uncloak the um, they were PF 105 mm. and forget that you are an advocate and now you become um, a member sitting in 
cabinet yeah. or you're a PS yes. or now you're uh, you have a position in parliament you forget that what legal profession are you going back to in fact some of the challenges as I look at um, our members in parliament I ask them as you continue to derode the role of the profession mm. I wonder what will happen five years down the line when you're not in favor of with your political party you'll have this legal profession that you have to walk back to at some particular point. And also a challenge that has been raised that some of these judges or magistrates who are removed from office um, for corruption, they try and w they find their ways back to the legal profession. There has to be a way that we punish them as well, that they cannot now easily find comfort to come and corrupt mm -hmm. on this other particular side. So yes, I agree there are things that need to be done and we will start that process. But for our members in positions of power, I would like to remind them, you know, Orang, now Governor Orang always says that, you know, government eats its own people. Mm. They need to remember that quite well. We have seen instances when power changes, what happens. Mm. And so that's, that's a hard lesson that they must remind themselves. I keep saying um, Emeritus um, Chief Justice Willie Mutunga yeah. um, at an NCAG meeting, he reminded, he had members of parliament and cabinet secretaries who were sitting in that meeting and he told them, you know, the former head of state kept saying that he will not obey court orders and their papers. The moment <laughs> he uncloaked his uh, presidency, he was rushing to courts to save his son. Mm. And so that is a stark um, reminder of the importance of the courts. Right. <laughs> how, how I, even as you mentioned that, I think one of the questions that then comes out is then how effective or how powerful then can lobbying that comes from a body such as the LSKB and would you be looking at activities whereby some of the things that we see basically swept under the carpet um, in society then are forgotten and I'm going to point directly to some of the things that come from the office of the Auditor General or the office of the control of budget with some of the things that we've seen where at the time I mean we just wrapped up a well not we but government just wrapped up um, a three-day conference on how to lower the wage bill okay but then we've seen that there have been queries they have been excesses for years coming out of the Auditor General's office we're not just talking about the person of Nancy Gathongo even before her the office of um, uh, Eddie, Eddie Uko making certain statements about queries that have come up and not one I dare say not one of those queries has been investigated to the point whereby somebody then is liable and held accountable for the kinds of losses and mismanagement and misappropriation that we've seen to the tune of trillions of shillings over years. What role would the LSK have in pushing for some of these things to come true? Because here we are on one hand saying that there's so much loss that's, that's happening and you can actually see the chain, mm -hmm. but then nothing is done. Would the roles of the LSK play out here as well? I'd say yes. Um, it's to pick up some of these reports and try and pick up one or two causes to follow to its logical conclusion. We'll have the challenge of also pushing not only um, the ESCC, but also the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, because these are two offices that ought to be independent and once the auditor general raises some of these queries and questions i i always say sometimes these public hearings in parliament they can be helpful and also they can fail to be helpful mm -hmm. um, because you see them going through a semblance mm -hmm. um, being asked questions um, if they answer them well or they're able to tactically ev evade them you see the matter is swept mm. under the carpet mm. thereafter we do not see recommendation for investigation by the director of public prosecutions mm. to ensure that um, he gets a proper file on some of these issues that have been raised or we see the ESEC taking up some of these corruption mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. 
Um, so as LSK will try and work closely, particularly with the ESCC and the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, mm -hmm. that some of these high cases, uh, high profile cases that are raised, we try and follow them up to their logical conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would say that as a nation, also, we have the role of media that I would push you, that you also have to play and support us in the same. Mm -hmm. That when we raise and highlight, it, it doesn't get swept up by the next news. As a, the problem we have in Kenya is that once the next succession comes up, everyone forgets what you are talking about. And so unless that information is raised continuously, mm -hmm. even if you're following up on the issue and it remains like it's a private issue, people ask, do you have a, public, a private interest towards that particular matter? So I think those are issues that we can continue raising together with the different stakeholders. And I call upon civil society as well. LSK can make, yes, a lot of noise. We can go to court. But some of these court cases, sometimes when you make a lot of noise in the in the court of public opinion then we can start seeing action being taken because of pressure coming up from the members of the public mm -hmm. i think the voice of the people still remains the most important voice and it's only when you see the the disquiet and i've been seeing some of the opinion polling i attended um a conference for opinion polling uh, recently and also bloggers and their space in uh, ensuring democracy and an independent voice of the people and i think the reaction of government by virtue that their position in members of the public continues to dwindle and that's why we're seeing certain prices of certain commodities are coming down because the reality is members of the public are also getting tired mm -hmm. um, as much as they may be goodwill but if you continue seeing the weight um, is laid upon you more and more without any reprieve and so i say as media as well if we could work together on certain endeavors because it's a simple question of telling people look at this is the corruption if somebody is saying there's no money for doctors, if you took this money that is lost and we paid the doctors, would we have that money? Mm. We took some of this money, we used it and we paid for those houses that we're talking about. We could give them to you for free. Mm. And so it's to sell that message and tell and be able to collate to people what that corruption means with regards to if it was us. We say we don't have money for subsidies. But if that money that has been lost to corruption would have been used to buy these certain bags of fertilizer or these certain bags of maize for you, then what does it mean to you as a people, as a nation? And so also the information that we share needs to be co in consumable amounts that people we all talk about corruption but the problem with corruption um, is that what is corruption you need to s tell corruption as it is in the yeah. language people understand that mm -hmm. is theft i'm stealing from you what would have benefited you, you. in this other way mm. because everyone has their interests and the question is what is in it for me I will stand and defend my member of parliament if he tells me this is, they're fighting me. Yes. Because I've stood against them or it's a fight against our people. But if you sell to them, this is theft. Money that could have been used to help you in this way. Mm. Set up, put up that bridge in, in Garissa that you'd be able to cross over tomorrow. Or this money would have helped you do, set up that road that would have been helped you to get your wares from the farm to the market, mm -hmm. then you sell a language that the people can understand. Otherwise, telling people corruption, corruption doesn't make sense. Indeed. So, are we looking at a year whereby a lot of these issues that we've discussed here, some of these elements, will actually come to life, whereby we're actually seeing this legalese broken down for Kenyans, for people to understand, to be able to consume, a real push for some of the things that would essentially be wrapped up in ignorance, actually brought to the fore and looking for um, um, uh, prosecution of some of these things, would we see that that would be more robust in this year under your leadership? Under my leadership, I'll work to ensure that we push for the same. And that's why as much as possible, I'm looking to work with different partners in civil society um, that you, you don't look like the lone voice mm. in uh, making, making the noise. Then you look like the madman in the village. 
but when you're working together with others and you're fighting a common cause then it looks like you actually have interests of the members of the public at heart mm -hmm. and so under my leadership that is what i hope that we'll be able to start and make that impetus um, towards that uh, direction Fantastic. Uh, Faith Odiambo is the president of the Law Society of Kenya. She's been our guest this hour. Always lovely to see you here and we continue to have these discussions. Santi Sana. Santi. Good morning. It's 8 a.m. Spice up your life. Detectives in Kisauni, Mombasa County have arrested a suspected drug trafficker who was found in possession of several sachets of heroin and bang. The suspect, Zuhair Ali Mohammed, was apprehended in an operation led by anti-narcotic detectives after concerned residents notified police of his illegal trade. Additionally, police recovered suspected drug money from the suspect and impounded his vehicle. The government will from next week test all children's syrups in Kenya, days after one batch was found to be contaminated with a chemical used in brake fluids. The pharmacy in Poison's bone, the medicines regulator, said the upcoming retest are just a precautionary measure. Dr. Anthony Trojic, the PPB head of product safety, says they would pick samples from the product in circulation and take them to the laboratory. The nationwide test follow a growing concern of the safety and necessity of cough syrups. Last week, Kenya recalled 11,000 units of an imported cough syrup that were found to contain unacceptably high levels of diethylene glycol. The sweet tasting chemical has antifreeze properties and a high boiling point. Now, the government may have to reduce the number of public workers to reduce the wage bill in the country. President William Ruto has once again said that his government is ready to make difficult decisions for the future of the country. The president has said that he aims to reduce workers' salaries from 46% to 35% of the GDP. We have a budget every year that has a fiscal deficit. 500. In fact, in 2022, we had a fiscal deficit deficit of a trillion meaning we were seeking to spend a trillion which we didn't have we pulled it to 800 billion we pushed, pulled it again to 600 billion as we go towards in the next three years as we go towards having a wage bill to revenue of 35 percent i will equally be driving to get a balanced budget so that we spend the money we can raise the money we cannot raise, we just be responsible, we relax until we raise the money so that we can spend it. Those will be the first to be fired from the public sector are those employed using fake educational certificates. Speaking at the conference to highlight the wage bill of civil service, Rudo said there are about 2,100 employed workers who are using fake certificates, saying that they must be taken to task and pay all the money that they have been paid since they were hired. We will now confront the monster of corruption head on going forward. Whether it is in counties, whether it is in the national government, just imagine a simple audit of people working for government has revealed that we have 2,100 so far people with fake certificates working for government. And just a simple audit. And from this conference, Madam Chair, I hope we are going to add one more resolution on fake certificates. Those who have earned money using fake certificates should refund us our public money. Expect to have power interruptions today in Nairobi and Kiambu counties. In a notice, Kenya Power said interruptions will be affected at advanced times between 8.30 a.m. and 5.00 p.m. in select areas in the two counties. It said that this is to facilitate system maintenance by its engineers. Areas to be affected in Nairobi include Dandora Phase 1 to 5, Parts of Kansala, Opuondo Road, Gitare, Marigo, part of Lucky Sama Estate, Gogosho, and adjacent customers. Part of Kiambu that will go without power during the scheduled period include Mudera Coffee, Hall of Muguda, Toll Station, Ruiru Golf Club, and Shell Toll Station customers around Karasi Beach, Titanic, Green Ridge, Muguda Secondary, Mudera Primary, Tumaini Catholic Church, Muguda 1 4 with all will also be affected according to Kenya Power. 
and the UN Palestinian Refugee Agency has said that some of its staff members and other people detained by Israeli forces in Gaza were subjected to ill treatment including severe beatings and being forced to strip naked. In a report, the agency said that staff that were detained in some cases while performing official duties were held incommunicado and subjected to the same conditions and ill treatment as other detainees which it said included several different forms of abuse the agency said staff members had said they were subjected to beatings and treatment akin to waterboarding threats of rape and electrocution and were forced to strip naked among other forms of ill treatment this is news i'm dennis Asato. good morning Okay, where are we at? A few minutes after 8 o'clock, traffic in the city still continues. But Thursday is actually not too terrible of a morning. I've seen that uh, we're moving wherever it is that you are. Um, coming in from the thicker superhighway, as usual, we'll see that traffic right around the tunnel. But then after that, I think we're all right. Getting on to um, Wangari Mathai Way or getting on to Muranga Road. And that traffic that was, you know, right around the Globe Cinema roundabout, we're not having that issue anymore. Ngong Road, a little bit of it here and there. And we're also taking a look at what's happening coming in on um, further up in Gong Road, coming in from the sides of Karen, some traffic out and about. And um, we're also seeing that we'll probably see that traffic coming off of the Red Hill Link Road, heading out towards Gigiri from the back route. Um, that also is packing up just a little bit. All right, we'll keep an eye on things and see what happens as we get through traffic hour. We'll talk on Spice of MKE on X hashtag The Situation Room. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Seven minutes situation after 8 room. o'clock, and I'm going the to jump right into it and ask, what is your plan? What's your plan for tomorrow? What's your plan for the week after? What's your plan for the month after or for the years that are coming? Do you not know or do you have an idea? Well, you need to take that idea and log on to www.plan.icealion.co.ke and they will have many options for you in terms of what you can activate. Or perhaps it's not one of those and you're just thinking along the lines of, okay, so I have a chunk of change and I need to be able to do one, two, three. How do we put all this together? Send an email, plan at icealion.co.ke and the good people down there will say, okay, look, how about we take what you're thinking and we take the expertise that we have in the market, we put that together, activate your plan and you'll be well on your way. So that's what they're saying. Come down, let's have a conversation and let us see what we can do about it plan.icealion.co.ke Where are you tuned in around the country and indeed around the world? Our live streams are up around on YouTube and on Facebook and also uh, greetings to our audiences on KTN Home. This hour, we are joined by the Senator for Nairobi County, Edwin Sifuna, and uh, he's already in the hot seat, a very busy man um, here and Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. Always a pleasure. It's uh, been a minute. Yes. Um, we have seen you, though. Yeah. <laughs> and we've heard you. Yeah. And it seems that people are afraid of you. Well, why would anyone be afraid of me? It's a wonder. I, I was more afraid of coming into this building this morning because um, <laughs> I've been hearing things about you people. 
<laughs> Good things, I'm sure. I want to be assured that uh, I will not leave here with anything <laughs> contagious. <laughs> it's good to see that uh, you're all in good health. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Ah, okay. Uh, Let's welcome you properly. Yeah, but there, there really is no reason to, for anyone to be afraid of me. I imagine. Uh, see, you've known me <laughs> yes, many, many yes, years. Yes, mm. I have. I am not dangerous at all. No, you're, no, not you're like a teddy. Bear with rainbows, so correct. So with rainbows as, flying out of your correct. ears. No, no, no. So long as one doesn't want to get into a debating match with you, <laughs> you, 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 you are harmless. No, for as long as you don't come to defend lies, you know, oh. it becomes very uh, difficult for people uh, when you come there to defend things that you actually don't believe in. I think people can tell when you're speaking something that you yourself uh, don't believe. believe in or mm. don't believe in. And uh, I have said that in, in this game of politics, I think credibility is everything. Uh, if you're not feeling something, I mean, uh, you should just be able to say uh, we have certain problems with certain things and, mm. and so on and so forth. Mm. And uh, because this uh, administration and regime have uh, done uh, quite badly, uh, I don't uh, envy uh, anyone on their side trying to defend any of the policies that have been, uh, you know, taken by, by government. Hmm. So, yeah, they are in uh, quite a bit of... Uh, <laughs> in a spot of ball. Ball. Yes, a spot of ball, okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll look into some of the details. So we'll look at two centers. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about that today. But City wants to welcome you properly. And yes, with the uh, famous City Proverbs. It's I don't know which country we are going to go to. Let's tell you where he got a visa to this week. We are in Cape Verde. Uh, that is in English. Yes. Cabo Verde in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. An aging man gets closer to his land, and an aging husband gets closer to his wife. <laughs> Where do you get this thing? Take it, buddy. Yeah. Mm. Well, we've seen we've seen it in uh, practice. Uh, people who retire from uh, work here in Nairobi in civil service, they go back home uh, mm. to get closer to where they will lie after uh, the Lord calls them. Mm. Okay. So maybe the people of Kevado are referring to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about the wife, but mm. uh, of course, uh, at that particular point in time, you don't have the energy to... <laughs> Uh, they also get closer to where they will lie when they come to the end of their No, life. no, they, <laughs> they, they hardly <laughs> lie there. They hardly lie there anyway, but uh, that is the person who will uh, uh, take care of you when you're not uh, looking uh, uh, <laughs> your best. Uh, your best. Uh, Long-suffering wives have to, you know, deal with uh, uh, the, the, the last vestiges of anything the, good. The weathered version of yourself. Yes. Mm. yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at some of these issues, <laughs> shall we? Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, we want to talk about, you know, centres whereby, of course, the centre kind of holds everything together. Yeah. And then we have, you know, the different arteries that then pump life. Yeah. Uh, so, there are two things that we could speak about today. And one of those would be the centre of the party for which you're Secretary General. Absolutely. And there have been discussions. Um, I mean, Rilo Dinger, will he take up the AUC position? Will yeah. it be given to him? Yeah. And thereafter, what happens to ODM? Yeah. And are we seeing that because of him my wanting uh, to take up that position will yeah. we then see the almost you know um it difficult to <laughs> avoid yeah. breaking apart of odm because the center which many have yeah. argued and many would have seen is held together by rilo dinga yeah what's the status right now uh, it is a good question on a good day because this morning we are having the uh, meeting of the National Governing Council of uh, ODM. This is uh, the second highest organ of a party that brings together uh, members of parliament, uh, leaders in the assemblies, mm -hmm. uh, the county coordinating chair committees, members of the National Executive Committee of a party. It is a huge organ, mm -hmm. but of course uh, second only to uh, the National Governing, uh, National Delegates Convention, which is about 3,000 people. Uh, it breaks right as hard, I have to say this here, mm. when people discuss about uh, ODM being about him and uh, projecting that without him uh, the party would not exist or would die. Mm. Because Raila has taken his time uh, over 20 years to build a formidable uh, political machine that has uh, grassroots networks, that has political leadership and uh, grassroots leadership at every level uh, of the country. So like uh, uh, this month we are starting our grassroots elections and we are starting it in nine 
10 counties and we are starting it at every individual polling station so that you have 20 delegates uh, representing uh, that particular polling station mm -hmm. and he has grown leaders you know so when he looks around and uh, he hears people saying oh without uh, me uh, this party is going to die yeah. it is something that absolutely just renders all the work that he has done in the last 20 years of building ODM uh, you know Nagatori so I want to assure uh, the supporters of ODM and the general public that in fact ODM possesses the capacity to be able to perpetuate itself beyond any single leader mm -hmm. and uh, I have seen uh, a debate uh, around the possibility of uh, uh, you know his absence from the party mm -hmm. uh, first of all he himself have, uh, has come out to say there is no vacancy in the leadership of a party there is no requirement uh, that uh, if he becomes a AU chairperson he cannot continue to be the party leader of ODM and uh, in the kind of uh, you know world that we live in right now an interconnected world where city can sit here and give us a proverb from Cape Verde, mm. which is farther than Addis Ababa. I don't think that it is going to be uh, difficult mm. uh, for us to get direction from the leadership of the party from Addis uh, in the event that uh, Baba is going to, uh, you know, uh, get that seat. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of the things that he has done is that he has come out to publicly admonish uh, some of the leaders who have, you know, engaged in uh, sectarian and and tribal and regional uh, politics when it comes to succession mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you cannot reduce an entity such as ODM that has representation and membership and leadership from all across the country to any one region or any one uh, sect or any one tribe uh, and uh, I think it has worked because we have seen a slowdown in some of those conversations uh, we as leaders in uh, ODM must be very responsible yeah. because uh, what is ODM without uh, say Hassan Jo what is yeah. ODM without weekly for Paranya what is ODM without Sifuna what is ODM without all these people Wandai and all the others uh, in fact if we we remain uh, together as uh, the leadership of the party uh, I think we are a quite a, a formidable force yeah. and uh, even when people argue that um, uh, Raila's shoes would be uh, very big to fit. Mm. Uh, my argument is that it would be too big to fit if you are uh, looking at it from a perspective of one leg going in. But if I put my foot in there, Wandai puts his foot in there, uh, Joho's foot is in there, mm -hmm. uh, Oparanya's uh, foot is in there, and all these leaders in, in ODM that uh, Baba has put together, and Badi and the others, mm -hmm. we will feel that shoe at some point. Yeah. Because nobody is trying to be uh, Raila Odinga, and I don't think anybody can be uh, Raila Odinga. You have to be yourself. He has his own style and his own abilities, and we recognize that, and uh, we have encouraged uh, the members of the party not to be drawn into those uh, sectarian fights about uh, who best uh, fits uh, the shoe. And is that a sense sentiment of consensus across board? I think the consensus will uh, will arrive at some point when everybody sees that uh, we are better off together than uh, uh, if we decided that oh we are going to do this as uh, Western Kenya, we are going to do this as a coast or this uh, as Luonyanza and so on and so forth. Uh, because I actually believe that ODM is a very formidable force. Just when you go into that meeting, like if you come today at Bomas and you look around the hall and see the people who are there, uh, this is a, a party that if we were to uh, remain focused, and we are the hope of very many Kenyans by the way uh, they might not express it all the time but uh, people actually uh, have said it to some of us mm. that without ODM I don't think that uh, uh, many people would have the, the will to leave mm. it is that big because you represent a certain hope uh, that uh, we wake up every morning to push back on the darkness because uh, there are evil people in this country and they found themselves somehow embedded in power and every single morning they wake up to conjure the worst ills against uh, the people of the Republic mm. and they are looking to see who is this one person, who is this organization that can actually speak out for Mwanaichi, or that can actually speak out for the doctors and uh, the, 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 the medical interns and, and the nurses and, and all these other people, the teachers and the common Mwanaichi, including the avocado farmer. Uh, so they look up to ODM, they look up to the opposition to be able to fill that gap and uh, we want to assure them that we will not let them down by allowing uh, sectarian or uh, regional or tribal differences to break apart the party. Right. Uh, you've heard me ask this question before yes. um, that I, I know that political parties at the very formation of the idea yes. are for an ideology that will carry the day. It's a vehicle to deliver Absolutely. certain things. And you've always been quite um, um, clear yeah. about what ODM has. So let's take that and graduate this yes. conversation to the position that you now sit in as Senator for Nairobi. Absolutely. In an oversight role 
a member of the party, yeah. one would assume that some, taking some of the tenets of those ideologies and then applying them to the position that you sit in today. We've seen you over the last few weeks yeah. sit in different uh, outfits, travel to different parts of the country asking questions yeah. about um, uh, accountability and the responsibility of certain individuals and what they do. Yeah. What is the problem right now? Because again, remember we're talking about centers. And yes. We're talking about another center of power, another center of responsibility that seems to be falling apart, breaking apart at the seams. Yes. And you in your position of oversight, again, have been very loud about some of these things and how we cannot allow them go to the dogs. What is going on? Well, the, there are a lot of problems in this country. Uh, one of the things that uh, we in ODM believe in, we d believe in democratic uh, governance, we believe in uh, respect for constitutionalism, and every time I'm on the floor of the house, if there is a piece of legislation that has come, we always begin with, is that document constitutional? That is what we do as ODM. Mm -hmm. And in fact, yesterday, if you were watching the proceedings in the house, mm -hmm. it was the first time in a long time that I saw a bill that is actually uh, drafted in line with the constitution, the 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 I think it is a gambling uh, bill. Mm -hmm. So it is most of the times we have seen that bills are originating from the national assembly that uh, want to take away uh, from uh, you know the powers that have been vested in uh, county governments. And most of the times you will see like uh, uh, issues such as housing. Housing is a devolved function. The national government has no business uh, getting itself uh, involved in uh, in devolved functions. Mm -hmm. And the pushback you see from us in, uh, in in the house is a reflection of that belief in ODM uh, that we have first of all to start by respecting the constitution. If you have uh, laws that come to then, uh, you know, uh, ruin the fabric of the constitution itself, it is our responsibility to stand up and say that this is something that we do not support. So we try our best. Uh, we fight and constitutional laws on the floor. Uh, of course, Kenyans and the people of Nairobi understand that I am outnumbered. Mm. I have publicly put out the number of votes that Kenyans can count on in the Senate. There are only 16 votes, people that I can count on to stand with the uh, uh, manifesto of uh, ODM, the, the, the values of ODM, the values of the opposition, and to respect the constitution and the oath that we took as elected uh, representatives. What do you mean only 16 votes? There are only 16 votes. What, do you, what does that mean? Like Those are, count on. Okay. So, for instance, for you to pass any legislation or to stop the passage of a legislation, uh, such as the housing bill, mm -hmm. uh, you need 24 votes. So we have 47 uh, total votes. That is, yes. each county has one vote. Yes. So if you have 47 uh, senators, you need 24 uh, to be able to do anything in the House. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I've uh, uh, run short uh, by eight votes. Mm -hmm. So those 16 senators are the only people I can assure Kenyans. If there is, uh, and they need to defend the Constitution or to defend the evolution, those are the guys who will come through at any particular point in time. The rest of them, the rest of them, I can assure you, those ones, uh, those ones cannot be counted upon to, to stand for, for anything in the House. Uh, hold on a minute, yes. uh, Senator. <laughs> 31 senators. Yes. You're essentially saying that if there's anything that is going to uphold the rule of law, yes. uphold the Constitution, yes. fight for the livelihoods of Kenyans, yes. that 31 senators will be against the Constitution? And that is the position. And I'll give you the classic example. Last year, we had uh, a very serious debate in the Senate on uh, division of revenue. And essentially, the role of a senator who you would expect would be to defend uh, your county government and ensure that you get the highest possible resource allocation. So two figures were put on the table, one suggested or proposed by uh, Gashagwa and Treasury of 385 uh, billion shillings as uh, shareable revenue to counties. Our own committee of finance, chaired by Senator Ali Roba, uh, proposed that we as a Senate, with the mandate to do this work, uh, vote for 407 billion shillings. Mm -hmm. uh, any rational person would expect that a senator would vote for 407. That motion was defeated because the Kenya Kwanzaa senators, who are the majority, voted for a lower figure. Mm -hmm. And I have asked the question in the House, then what gives you the right to complain? If you go to your county <laughs> and there are no drugs in hospital, mm -hmm. what moral authority do you have to complain? And this is the, the, the classic example. If I cannot convince you to take money, like I tried to convince them yesterday to mm. take money on an arsenal loss. They refused. How, what else can I convince you over if I can't convince you to take money for your people? Mm. So I, I walk around Nairobi and I, I, I can uh, very boldly ask, ask questions because I know that my voting record on the, in the House is, is proper. I have tried to push the envelope for Nairobi. Uh, if the senators uh, who voted against the 407 had voted with me, 
Nairobi would have gotten an extra 200 billion shillings but because of what 2 billion shillings but because of what they did I lost about uh, 1.5 billion shillings that mm. would have come extra to Nairobi. So last year, Nairobi only got an uh, increment of about 800 million uh, Kenyan shillings. And uh, I am happy that uh, I was able to push that envelope for the people of Nairobi. Mm. When you walk around all our health facilities, for instance, uh, there is a project that has stalled at every level five hospital in Nairobi. You go to Mutuini, there's a, an expansion uh, project for the outpatient department that is stalled. We need about for 45 billion, million shillings for the uh, contractor to come back. You go to Mbagadi, the story is the same. You go to Mamalusi, the story is the same. You go to uh, 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 Pumwani, mm -hmm. the story is the same. Sports stadium, you go to city stadium. I had my governor saying that uh, the, the contractor is now back. Mm. But when I was there in February, the contractor had uh, abandoned the site. Mm. So uh, the same story at uh, Joseph Kangede grounds in Woodley, the same uh, story at all other uh, county facilities that are being built. We have problems with garbage. Our uh, garbage collectors, uh, the, the, the contractors, have been on strike for the longest time. Garbage has not been collected from some places since uh, September of last year. So we have a lot of problems in Nairobi. And when I'm in the Senate, my work is to make sure that I eliminate any excuse for the governor. I try and push the envelope to get as much resources as possible. And this is the fight we are in uh, with the national government mm -hmm. because uh, they want to devolve functions, but they don't want to devolve uh, resources. So like yesterday, when the CS for Health is in the, in the Senate, we, we actually should not have a CS for Health if we are going to implement the Constitution uh, to its latter because health is a function that has devolved. The ministry has no need to exist mm. because the counties should be able to uh, formulate policy and do all the things that are required to be done under uh, the health uh, function. But they have refused to release uh, the, the resources that then would allow governors to properly execute their mandate. But this is not a problem that is particular to this particular government. Yes. It is a problem that has existed. It has existed since, since uh, the, the advent of devolution. Yes. And uh, one of the arguments that I've made is uh, uh, we, we as a country, I think, lost our way in 2013 because we needed the people who actually believed in some of these concepts to be the first people to be handed that document to implement. Mm. Uh, but if you have people who uh, were centralists, people who always believed that uh, uh, the country was better off being run from Nairobi, being the first people to implement, then they don't give oxygen, they don't breathe air into the, some of these ideas. And that is where I believe we lost the path. We shouldn't be in a situation where uh, governors essentially have to beg for money. Mm. Uh, yet it is a constitutional right. And when you hear the national government speaking, you would think that the county governments have all the money. The county governments, as I've told you last year, got only 385 billion shillings. Out of a 3 trillion plus uh, budget, it is uh, less than, what, 15% of, uh, of the total budget. So the people with the bulk of the money, uh, and by the way, one of the most interesting things is that whereas everybody can tell how much money comes to their county through devolution, mm -hmm. nobody can tell you, city, how much of the central uh, government money is utilized in your county. And that is what the biggest problem is, because they, the national government has the biggest chunk of, of resources. But the way they distribute it, it is not looked at and uh, scrutinized the way that we scrutinize the money that goes to the county governments. So I would love for there to be a, a leadership in this country that publishes a list of all the national government projects that have been undertaken so that we can see the equity in their distribution. If you are distribu if your uh, national government is doing uh, 10 dams, and nine of them are in one region. Where is the equity? Well, Where is the equity? And then when you complain, they tell you, oh, but you have your money with your governor. What is your governor doing? And yet, the chunk of the money is not with the county government. Mm. It's with the national government. It's with the national government. Are you, I, I hear you, and I think maybe subtly and sometimes overtly, yeah. uh, alluding to the fact that whether at the National Assembly, can't speak for that, you can speak for the Senate, Yeah. that individuals are doing the bidding of the executive as opposed to representation of the people yes is that that is exactly what i have said uh, because it doesn't uh, make any sense that uh, a member of parliament would vote uh, against the interest of his own people and of himself 
So the classic example, another one is uh, the finance bill of last year. You've had members of parliament themselves coming out to say that they didn't know what they were voting for. After they went to the ground and uh, during the implementation of the same law that they passed, they realized it is uh, detrimental, quote-unquote, to their own people. Uh, so I asked the question one time, uh, why is it not possible? On important uh, votes such as uh, the finance bill, why is it not possible for that vote not to be taken in Nairobi in the National Assembly, but every member of parliament go back to their constituency, sit in a town hall with, uh, <laughs> with his constituents, and the question is put to him, uh -huh, member of parliament mm. for Westlands. Uh, what say you about taxation of your people? Should we increase uh, VAT on fuel? <laughs> In that social hall, yeah. what do you think that member of parliament will do? <laughs> because the, uh, the Senate and the National Assembly, you know when you get into that building, it's like a banker. You feel very safe there. Mm. Even if there are protesters out there making noise, you know for a fact they can never breach <laughs> the security that is there. The aircon is very nice. Mm. It is like, uh, it is far much better than this room, I okay. can assure you. Okay. Uh, the seats are very comfortable. Mm -hmm. So when you're sitting there, you know that the, the people of uh, 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 North Hall mm. cannot reach you. <laughs> they probably are not even watching what you're doing. <laughs> so when instructions come from state, I was saying, Ikitu Lazima to petition. And you've heard, uh, you've seen the president in public rally saying he's waiting to see which member of parliament is Will. going to go against his word, you know. And that is a sort of uh, uh, problem that we have in this country. Uh, I want Kenyans to understand one thing. We must emancipate one institution at least in the, in the next election. Who do you think it's going to be? You must emancipate parliament. I think that is the most critical uh, organ that you need and to emancipate. How exactly does one do this, Senator? I think it is critical to look at the people that you elect. But that is and, what and we the, do the, every, the, elect, the, the, every election cycle. That's what we do. No, but there is a conversation that is happening in this country that I want to encourage. I think everyone is uh, uh, now asking some right questions. Uh, at the very minimum, can the member of parliament you're voting for read? Can he read? Well, Let's start there, first of all. The bar is low. Why, why are you getting shocked? I'm wondering how. <laughs> yeah, because wondering. you have, you okay. have had public Senator, conversations. Senator, Senator, I'm sorry, Senator, 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 the question come is off this. yesterday having a conversation about <laughs> fake certificates and now we're lowering the bar even more. I, I'm telling you. That there are people who cannot read. I'm telling you that is where the conversation needs to begin. <laughs> you might love this person. They might be from your clan. They might be your brother. They might be your sister. Do they have capacity to do the job that they're asking for? So can that person read? And will they read? Because those are two different uh, questions. Can they just give an assurance that they will not vote for something they have not read? Can they then debate that uh, bill or that proposal before the Houses of Parliament? Will they be able to express your views on that bill? Because they are representatives. They are not giving their own views. Will they be able to do that? And when voting comes, will they exercise that power with conscience? So those are the questions that... And I'm happy that discussion is happening in, in many places in the country. And people are questioning uh, some of the people who ended up as their representatives in, in the National Assembly, in the, mm. in the Senate. So me, for me, because of the critical role of parliament, I think the focus of Kenyans has to be uh, that we need to elect people uh, with certain capacity to do the job okay. and some level of uh, uh, you know, intellectual uh, independence okay. so that they are able to represent properly. But, but surely, business. Senator, you know very well that, that what you're saying is aspirational because... Our voting patterns, by and large, have very little to do with what we're saying. But, City, I don't want you to get stuck in that, because that is something that people no, keep saying. I'm not getting stuck in it. I'm merely stating I know. But, but Kenya is changing. I am telling I you, would this like country it, is changing. I would like it. You see, you mm. represent an aspect of that aspiration that we're talking about. You. Yes. As an individual. I cannot say the same for very many people. But th th this, is th this is the point that I'm making, mm. City, that we all as Kenyans have a responsibility to start that conversation and make sure that this happens. And in many places, I am telling you these conversations are happening. Actually because happening. Uh, many people, uh, especially the young people, uh, who did not think that uh, politics uh, takes a notice, are actually realizing that politics will never ignore you. Uh, and especially uh, immediately you start making any money. It will find uh, whether you. Whether it's on uh, TikTok or, <laughs> or wherever. wherever it is you are. We will find you. Let's so, take a break on that note and then we come back. <laughs> there are some big questions also emanating from some, you know, just concluded conferences taking place and also asking the role, again, of positions such as yours, such as yours uh, in terms of bringing some of these things to life. So we'll come back and continue with that. Okay. Um, it's 27 minutes to the top of the hour. Senator Edwin Sifuna is our guest this hour. It continues after this.
This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Thank you very much, Eric, and it's good to be at the Situation Room. Always a pleasure coming here. This is the most challenging uh, interview panel in Kenya. You guys are very well informed, and as you can see, Charles, today, very philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> To be poor in this country is the greatest sin you can commit, not just from a legal perspective, but from life generally. Yeah. It, it, it is very, very skewed. We've just heard uh, on the floor of parliament, just most recently, a leader within the ODM saying that Sisi Nimombe is a baba. Yeah. Which means that you are willing to be milked dry. <laughs> you cannot force me to believe. I'll give away. If it's a land that I'm told to return to you, I will. Okay? Because the court has said so. But I'll continue saying, oh, what to a many Russia. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that I'm doing. <laughs> the Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Eighteen degrees and uh, sunny conditions in Nairobi. It's eighteen and sunny in Nakuru, and eighteen and sunny in Nyeri. Sixteen and sunny in Eldoret, and we're looking at partly sunny conditions at twenty-five in Mombasa, with twenty-six and partly sunny in Malindi. It's sunny at twenty-two in Kisumu, and sunny conditions at twenty-two in Kakamega. Out in Kampala, it's cloudy at twenty-two, and Dar es Salaam is sunny at twenty-five. We're looking at Johannesburg, sunny conditions at twelve, while in Mogadishu at thirty, it's sunny at nineteen. Partly sunny in Addis Ababa, 27 and clear in Lagos, and 25 and cloudy in Kinshasa. Spice up your life. Looks like you're journeying to the city and out of the city will be short and sweet today. Not uh, much happening with traffic. Uh, that Pangani Tunnel is probably where we'll see the most of it uh, right about now. Limu Road seems to be flowing smoothly, getting into the CBD today. Uh, coming off of Waiaki Way with what was going on on James Gishiro earlier, that looks much better. And uh, just a little bit of traffic coming off Landy is going towards the Kamkunji roundabout. We are in traffic hour, but it surely doesn't feel like it uh, because traffic is not doing that craziness it normally does. So it's a good Thursday, you know. Just in case it gets crazy, talk to us on Spice of MKE on X hashtag the situation room. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94. Nairobi County, Edwin Sifuna is our guest this hour and uh, looking at a number of things and again looking at centers and saying that are we holding on to things or are things actually falling apart um, and looking at the roles of oversight. I asked this question, the Law Society uh, of Kenya President was here the last yeah. hour and some of the questions we asked in terms of investigations that happen, uh, things that are said, um, the Auditor General, I mean give some yeah. queries over and over again and we ask ourselves who is responsible who is responsible for asking the questions and actually seeking for persecution or rather prosecution and maybe persecution as well but okay and Parliament is front and center when the yeah. question is asked yeah so Why, we what what's 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 happening in this particular area I think for us uh, as members of Parliament and especially us in the Senate we we take our oversight role uh, very very seriously and uh, sometimes oversight is uh, interpreted as uh, witch hunt. I have seen newspapers, including the standard newspaper, <laughs> uh, claiming that uh, uh, because we are doing our jobs, we have begun early campaigns. When Sifuna goes to Mbagathi yes. to ascertain whether there are drugs at Mbagathi, that doesn't mean I'm running for governor. And I have said it publicly, I am not interested in being governor of Nairobi. Okay. I am happy with the job that I have been given as a senator of Nairobi. It is not a witch hunt against uh, uh, anybody. Mm. When I request that so-and-so uh, uh, appears before a certain committee mm. uh, or so, so appears before the full house we don't call governors before the senate to ask them uh, their favorite uh, tiktok filter or your favorite color or your favorite meal mm. no we are there to discuss serious issues and if you impede my oversight duty mm. by refusing to show up to someone's of the committees of the senate i will do it on the media mm. it is that simple no mm. because Look at the instances, for instance, with uh, my governor. What yeah. have we been summoning gov uh, Governor Sakaja over? 
at the energy committee we summoned governor sakaja over the muradi fire incident right that is not a light matter mm. it is not a joke mm. it is something that you would think everybody would prioritize we have had opportunity to speak to every uh, agency that was involved either in regulation or licensing of that uh, gas plant. Mm -hmm. We lost lives there and do. It's mm -hmm. not a joke. True. So we have spoken to uh, EPRA. We have spoken to the CS Chirchir, made time to come before the Energy Committee. Uh, we have spoken to NEMA. The missing link is the governor of Nairobi. At the Housing Committee, what were we calling Zakaja to do? Mm. We were not there to. Uh, he's not at our favorite. We like to see him. We want to see him every day. We want to see him every day. No. Yeah. We were there because of a petition by residents of the 13 estates that his county government is redeveloping under the urban regeneration program. And these people are saying, the people from Woodley, Jericho Lumumba, they are there asking questions, the questions that only the governor of Nairobi can answer. So when we summon him and he fails to appear five, six, seven times, it is not us he's disrespecting. He's disrespecting the people of Nairobi. And you cannot say that it is a witch hunt. What were we calling him about at the Public Accounts Committee of the Senate? It is precisely what you have asked. We want to interrogate uh, uh, the reports of the Auditor General. Mm -hmm. These are not Sifuna's reports. Mm -hmm. It is not Sifuna who said there are 30 roads that are stalled in Nairobi. It is not me. It is not Sifuna saying that there was a regular procurement of pro uh, bitumen, for mm -hmm. instance, in the 2023 report. Mm -hmm. So when he uh, fails to appear, he is impeding my capacity and the capacity of the Senate to do its job of oversight. Mm -hmm. Nairobi, by the way, has adverse reports for the last I think since uh, the evolution since began, evolution it is began. either adverse reports or disclaimers. We want to sit down with Zakaja, and we are not fools. We understand that some of them relate to a period where he was not governor. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is we need to close those audit queries so that we find out the people responsible, because those people have not gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. God has preserved them. They have not died. <laughs> they are there. We know them. We can see them on social media. Mm -hmm. And Senate has power to call anyone, including people who were previously in that administration. Yeah. So what you're supposed to do, and we have seen all governors, by the way, all governors appear before committees, of uh, the senate yes it is only my governor who for some reason is always traveling and finds an excuse to be outside the country or to be unable to appear before the senate last two weeks i'll give you a classic example and you might say i'm saying this because he's a governor from odia mm. there's an old man who is almost 80 years old and he's a governor of kisumu but he appeared before the parliamentary uh, committee on uh, investments mm -hmm. chaired by Ososi about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Last week, he was before the Parliamentary Accounts Committee of the Senate to answer audit queries on behalf of the people of Kisumu. And by the way, even in the instance of Kisumu, there are adverse reports. And we were not uh, there to massage anyone. Our role requires that even if uh, Governor Nyongo mm. is my political mentor, it is known. Mm. Mm. He's uh, SG Emeritus. He's one of the people who has, uh, you know, guided me and indicted me in my life in politics. But when I am there, Governor Nyongo understands that I have a constitutional responsibility to ask questions. And that is exactly what we did. So when you see people evading uh, uh, responsibility and oversight and accountability, there is a problem there. So all we are saying is that, and, and uh, by the way, we do this for all county governments. Mm -hmm. One of the things we have realized uh, uh, as senators is that presence on the ground is everything. Because if you sit in your air-conditioned room there at KICC and you're told uh, we, are, we, are, we are going on, work at the city stadium is going on, and you are, eh? in the, and you are there, seated there, you have to go on the ground and see for yourself, including projects that they claim they have completed. If you say you have built Dandora Stadium, we should yes, say. people can, can see the stadium is yeah. there. But the job of oversight, you have to go beyond. If they say, if you look at the bill of quantities and it says we were building a 15,000 capacity stadium, go there and count the seats. And make sure that they're 15,000. Correct. Okay. That is what oversight is. Mm. If you look at the bill of quantities and it tells you that uh, this was supposed to be uh, a concrete structure and you go there and you find mabati, mm. or the seats were supposed to be uh, mabati and you find plastic, that is the job of oversight. Now, let me ask you something. Yes. From that point where it is clear that there's an issue, and I think this is a bane, 
from the point where you find that there is an issue, yes. what happens next? Because now, it seems as though, Senator, yes. that we find these problems and we say, okay, yes, we found this problem and we park it. We found this problem and then we put no, it no, there. No, 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 no. We find this problem and then we put it there. We, what has happened? We, we, actually do we, not, we actually do not park it. What happens? So the committees have certain powers. Mm. And uh, if you follow the discussion uh, last time, uh, there was actually a proposal to stop uh, the disbursement of money to the Nairobi County government. Mm -hmm. It is uh, a, an action that we can take so that they remedy uh, all the gaps that we have identified. We recommend prosecutions. There is an officer from the ESCC that is embedded in the committee. They sit there with us okay. all the time. There is a, 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 an officer from Treasury who sits there with us during the audit process. So it is not an exercise in futility. But you need to understand that for us as a, a parliament, we can only act within the powers that we have. Some of the frustration that uh, we have expressed is we don't want to be lamenting all the time that a governor has been unable uh, to show up. Mm. You find somebody, uh, because the, the Powers and Privileges Act uh, provides for a fine for somebody who fails to show up to parliament, and uh, the figure has been set at 500,000 shillings. This is peanuts to some of his governors. Mm. It is pocket change. It can barely buy him a business class ticket to Dubai. Mm. You know? So we, what do we do? We come up with a motion to enhance these fines. We say let it go to 2 million. And we would like to have uh, as a house, as parliament, powers of arresting these characters. So because that recommendation, and that, because it, for me this is extremely serious. Yes. I'm going to paint the picture. We just had a three-day, okay, they, the government, yeah. just had a three-day conference yes. where the discussion of lowering the wage bill was questioned, was brought in, and that was the main issue, from 47% to 35%, right? Yes. Certain things came out as a result of that. Mm. 2,100 ghost workers exist in yes. this country. They know who they are. They are paying them a salary every month, but then somebody... Oh, sorry, no, 2,100 people with fake certificates, mm -hmm. rather, are working in public service, mm -hmm. in government, yes. as public officers. They know who these individuals are, and they've given them time um, until the end of the year to resign. <laughs> and at the same time, pay back money that they have earned in what the president himself is saying, illegal payments. Okay? Yes. Now... For when you make a recommendation like that, recommendations that you've said, recommendations for prosecution and things like that, yes. how do we see that there's a connect between the recommendation that has been made yeah. and something actually being done? It's the recommendations that I talk about that seem to be parked mm. and that they gather dust and that nobody really does anything about them. Yeah. Who is to say that for sure we will see the string connected between A and B? That's the issue, Senator. Yeah, now, that is an issue that I accept. The, the, there is a, a problem in this country. Uh, and this is why, uh, when we talk about democratic governance as ODM, we would want there to be independence of institutions. The truth of the matter is, for as long as you have uh, people in power who don't believe in these things that you're talking about, it will never happen. Because at the end of the day, we have heard stories of... Uh, uh, investigative agencies and they speak to us they're also very frustrated an investigator does a proper job uh -huh. it is the dci he has descended on a county he has found the governor with his hand in the cookie jar clean clean he's wearing the cookie jar correct he's actually the, the, the he's, inside, he's, inside, he's, inside. he's inside the cookie jar <laughs> and then he recommends prosecution to the odpp this governor calls the friends of the president yeah and the president uh, says, oh, okay, mambo uh, namna gani, namna hii, sawa. And he actually calls people within the justice system to say, hiyo file kwanza, uh, ingoje kwanza. Mm. Eh, ingoje kwanza. And the file is put aside. And the file is put aside. That is the frustration of Kenyans. Everybody understands that this is the problem that we have. If you do not have a leadership in this country that can actually follow through on these things, then we are, we are not going anywhere, city. We're not going anywhere. And unfortunately for that, even Sifuna has no solution. The only solution is with the people. I have always said that you cannot elect bad people and expect good things to happen in the country. Mm -hmm. And our, uh, you know, our inclinations to bad manners are known. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody's history, a city was giving me his history of growing up in Mombasa. Mm -hmm. Your history is who you are. Because it is the constitutive years. The things that are imparted at that young age. If you, grow up, if you grow up as a thief or somebody who lives around people who glorify thievery and, and stealing, uh, call it whatever it is you want to call it, 
you are likely when you grow up not to <laughs> frown upon mm. so, some of his practices. You are likely to accommodate. Yeah, you are very accommodating yeah, to some of his things. Yeah. But, but, but you see, the it isn't all dark. No, it isn't. You are the one who was trying to paint a dark picture. <laughs> I was trying to explain to you that Kenyans have begun talking. Mm. Actually, painting a realistic picture doesn't mean you're painting a dark picture. <laughs> okay. Okay. It, it is, it's just that sometimes the reality is not an easy pill to swallow. Okay. And even the efforts that the Senate is making, it's in the public domain we see it. Yes. We even report it. Thank you. It isn't void. It isn't for nothing, and it isn't as though it's not bearing fruit. No, yes. it is. You see, the what daunts the public is when the public perceives that those who are elected are doing nothing. Yeah, and that is what now stupefies them, and they are not unable to move. But so long as there is a sign that there is movement, see, my mind goes back to the history of this country when we had yeah. one party. Okay, yeah. yet within that one party, there were people who dissent yeah. within that party. And dissent loudly and at that point in time they knew there was a cost to that dissent but yeah. they dissented anyway anyway okay yeah now, and, and i want to encourage you city uh, <laughs> because honestly speaking i know that uh, at least for the people of nairobi mm. the people of nairobi appreciate the effort uh, that uh, yes they can see that the odds are stacked against you but they want you to put up a fight yes. and it is bearing fruit because i can tell you for a fact uh, there is things that we have done on that floor of the house that has uh, has bo borne fruit. The classic example is uh, today, uh, the, the Minister for Defence came to the Senate yesterday after I wrote to him and uh, summoned him to the house to explain to us what is happening at Uhuru Park because I couldn't get those answers from uh, my governor. And today he's handing up, uh, back the park to Nairobians. He had invited me for that ceremony, but of course I have to be here and I have to be at the NGC. Uh, somebody had grabbed uh, Tomboya Social Hall in Makadara. And uh, when we put uh, the uh, CS for Lance uh, to task, she came and uh, she has uh, declared that that uh, accusation was illegal. Uh, I was uh, being informed yesterday by my people on the ground that the contractor has since abandoned site. I had written to the governor to tell him, now that we have this pronouncement in the Senate that uh, the land was illegally acquired and it's public land, why don't you go ahead and revoke all the uh, development approvals that you had given this developer? Yes. And, uh, and so on and so forth. There is a question of our visit with the health committee to city mortuary. I can show you messages from the area MCA, DNG Ngubuini, that immediately we left uh, there. Money has been found to, fa to buy the generator <laughs> that was lagging at City Bochari. Uh, the contractor is back at uh, Woodley, uh, Joseph Kangede grounds. The contractor is back at City Stadium. So the noises that we make in, uh, in the Senate... It's not futile. Uh, it's not futile. No. And I want to assure the people of Nairobi that for as long as I have a voice, mm. for as long as I can talk like the way I'm talking like this, mm. I will speak for them all the time. Some uh, things we will win, some we will lose, because especially those that require a vote. Right. I know. You're just 16. I, I know I have only 16. Mm. But on every other aspect, I can assure the people of Nairobi that I will always speak for them. When we're looking at the country as a whole, yes. uh, Senator, and we see, we look, we see the different things that are going on, whether we're talking about, you know, <laughs> across board, the one that's probably hitting us harder, uh, hardest right now is a doctor's strike and whether yes. they're going to be having, people are going to discuss whether they're going to come to a con consensus. But then we see pockets of other things that are happening and one would wonder, you know, is the center holding? And I'm going to ask that question again yeah. for you, what you see what can be done no i think it is a, it is a great challenge uh, the greatest challenge of our times uh that uh, uh, we can have an administration first of all that uh, doesn't listen to the people at all uh they insist that uh, it is going to be their way or the highway and uh, those of us who believe in democracy and democratic governance of the people as required by the constitution really don't see anything uh, positive in in that sort of approach and the challenge will always be thrown back to Kenyans. Uh, see, even if we fail, please let us have this conversation about electing good people. And goodness is something that can objectively be ascertained. Over a period of time, observe somebody's life over a period of 30 and 40 years. You will uh, come to know his proclivities and inclinations. Senator, I'm in, and <laughs> I'm in, I'm in agreement with you. Yeah. We, we, it's something we discuss here on a daily basis. Yes. And we always arrive at this point. How does the public then hold the elected leaders to account mm. you see you are holding the governors to account yes okay we need to hold you to account yes 
that mechanism that uh, unfortunately energy. unfortunately uh, city there was a, a very good mechanism that had been woven into the constitution on the right of recall of members of parliament yes mm. uh, but parliament went and made that process oh, impossible oh yes, yes, uh, yes because yes. they changed the the, the rules and they and did. made it so difficult for, it down yeah, completely. for completely for anyone to be able to recall anyone we as political party leaders also have suffered the same fate i am unable to recall people who have uh, very obviously decided that they no longer uh, ascribe to the values of ODM. They've decided that they're going to uh, be, you know, in bed with other political parties, despite clear provisions of the law. And uh, it is a frustration that we all share. And I wish we gave uh, people back that power. Because I can assure you, City, uh, if that power was there, uh, like maybe 60% 60, 60 of members of parliament would have been recalled from the finance bill vote mm. alone. Mm. Alone. And if they knew that that sword was hanging over their heads, they, they would have, have done the right thing. They because they would have told the president, eh, Ndugu. Ndugu, my people, my people uh, don't want this thing. Mm. Yeah. Do people today have the power to actually hold themselves accountable or even the desire? Because I think that's where it yeah. is. That we know the right thing to do, still choose not to do it, and then yeah. hope that by some miracle, things will go right. And it doesn't matter where we look. It does across board at whatever level. Yeah. That's what it looks like. Because again, people put you in that position where there is a hope and the desire that you actually do the right thing. And we can see if the right thing is being done. Yeah. We can touch. We can see. Is there the innate desire to actually do the right thing? Or is the desire to be subservient to the person who you think? We, we have argued, uh, some of my friends argue that in fact, uh, the modus uh, in this country is first to identify the right thing. Then we all agree that this is not what we're going to do. <laughs> because sometimes Kenya sit down and they, they look at the decisions that are taken. And like, this guy cannot be dumb, as dumb as he looks, not to know that this is the direction that is the right direction. <laughs> it has to be deliberate that, yeah, let, let's just depart radically from what is right. But I hear you, uh, the frustrations of Kenyans uh, uh, is there. And uh, unfortunately, the accountability mechanism it has been neutered down the right of recall of members of parliament has been neutered down it has been made impossible actually uh, the uh, impeachment power in the county assemblies is also subject to very uh, many machinations lengthy and convoluted uh, uh, processes it's not even the processes yes. there, there, there are other uh, extenuating circumstances <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> that are existed there in the relationship between uh, the members of the county assembly the members and the governors when you hear a governor in his address on the state of the county mm. openly proclaiming that members of the county assembly will be given a house each from a development that is essentially supposed to be for affordable housing mm. for people who are not in that bracket what is that uh, city <laughs> And it is on live TV. Mm. Uh, the country is watching. And you are saying, you, the people who are supposed to oversight me, mm. are going to each get a house in this uh, housing in project. How do you ever expect that uh, member of the county assembly to we even do account? the job that I do and to scrutinize and say, hey, 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 boss, mm. you said you are building three-bedroom houses. How are they two-bedroom? And they are watching the Siako three-bedroom. <laughs> you know that argument of Siiko? Mm. It is very annoying city. Like one of his uh, uh, programs of a county. Yes. When you go and ask questions about the dish in a county, the food for education thing, mm. you are told, but Sifuna, the children are eating. Yeah. Okay, the children are eating. What are they eating? eating yes. Where did it come from? Bro, yes. Who brought it? Yes. That is the work of oversight. Mm. If I go to a, 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 a kitchen, that is cooking food for our children. And my expectation is that if it is rice, it is more rice or at the very worst, aero mm -hmm. rice. Mm -hmm. And I find it is rice from India. Am I wrong to ask the question, why, why? are we feeding uh, our children mm -hmm. uh, uh, rice from India and yet they are? Uh, we actually grow rice. Yeah, yes, we actually, we actually grow rice. If I go there and ask uh, governor, if 70% uh, of our children are not in public primary schools, why is this program being run only in public primary schools? Yes, the food in, uh, if you go to uh, Kwanjenga Primary down here, mm. Kware Primary, there is a kitchen, children are eating. Yes. But the vast majority of the children in uh, Mbakasi South are not in public primary schools. So if I ask you, is in this discrimination 
because we all pay taxes. Why are you feeding only 30% of your children? Mm. That is not to say if Una is against a program. I want this program to, to run. Work. I want it to be sustainable. I want it to help farmers. If Ndengu is being fed to children in Kware, mm. why is that Ndengu coming from uh, a supplier who is related to somebody in the county government? That is a question that I can validly ask. Sure. That is not to say that I am against a program. So what we need to do, uh, first of all, we need to distinguish politics from uh, oversight. Yes. Because I have had people saying, oh, this is premature. And you're fighting uh, it only because activism. You are fighting because if Una wants to be governor, my friend, the day I want to be governor of Nairobi, because you know me, I will stand up in broad daylight mm. and say I want to be governor of Nairobi. Mm. And I will explain why I want to be governor of Nairobi. Mm. And I'll explain why I'm uniquely qualified to be governor of Nairobi. But when I am doing my job as a senator of Nairobi, you cannot bring stories to me. And I'm telling you, uh, Ndu, mm. Some of these things are very frustrating because uh, I have seen people making comments there online saying, oh, you know, uh, ODM is a majority party in, uh, in, in the assembly. Why are they not doing anything? And why is Sifuna... Where is the opposition? Where is the opposition? I am telling you. You see, for me, I'm like, uh, who, is, uh, <laughs> yeah? who is the best striker who scored yesterday? <laughs> yeah? Eric Haaland, for mm. instance. You ask, you ask but I depend, I depend yeah. on the assembly. That is the Kevin De Bruyne. They need yeah. to just give me a pass. Mm. That's, That's all yeah. And they'll see what I will do in the Senate with that uh, <laughs> governor. Okay. Great note to end on. Senator Edwin Sifuna, thank you for being here this morning. Do not tire. That's what I'll say. I will, I will not. That's, that's what we'll say goodbye with. Uh, thank you for being here. Always a pleasure to have you here. And we want to continue to have these conversations. Yeah. We always say, as you have a conversation, two things will happen. That somebody will continue with the conversation yes. or that somebody will do something yeah. about that issue. And by the way, mm. uh, I wanted to say this uh, mm. because uh, City said something that, oh, you are the only person who said. I, I am I'm telling you there are good people in this country. Yeah. And I have taken it as a responsibility, not just as SG of ODM. Yeah. I, we, as a generation, we need to find each other. Those good people, we need to find, find each other. Because once we have critical mass, imagine if I am able to hold those 16 Senate seats mm. and then go out to the other counties and tell them, please, I need eight more. Mm. And if I come back to the Senate as a majority leader, I can assure Kenyans you will have a very good time. Yeah, yeah. Irrespective of who will be president of the <laughs> republic. For as long as I am there and I have those 24 votes, mm. I can assure you, city, you will see things. Because mm. the president right now, if, if Ruto mm. uh, brought that housing levy mm. to the Senate knowing Sifuna is a majority leader and have 24 votes, yeah. what do you think would happen? One can only ask or imagine. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Senator, for being here this morning. <laughs> Again, looking forward to the next conversation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's 9 a.m. <laughs>17 suspects who had been arrested in connection with the murder of a police officer in the Rieda sub county last month will take a plea on April 30th, 2024. The suspects who appeared before CIA High Court Judge Justice Daniel Odembon Wednesday failed to take plea for the second time since they have still not undergone a mental assessment. Justice Odembo directed that the suspects be released on a personal bond of 200,000 shillings and a surety of a similar amount each pending the mental assessment which has not taken place because of the ongoing doctor's strike. Domestic shocks in emerging economies in the G20 such as China, Kenya's single leading source of imports, are increasingly impacting the country's growth. This is according to International Monetary Fund's April 2024 World Economic Outlook report, which attributed the downgrading to 5% from 5.5% last year to the shocks. However, the lender says the growth prospect will rebound in 2025 at a pace of 5.3%. Tough times await bribe thirsty traffic police officers should propose law seeking to nip in the bad the vice sale through in Parliament. 
MPs are considering a law which among others seeks to confine the operations of traffic officers to designated areas where they will be under constant surveillance. The bribery bill 2024, sponsored by nominated MP Obadia Barongo, is before the National Assembly Administration and Internal Affairs Committee. It proposes the designated areas be under CCTV surveillance. Tesla is again seeking to award boss Elon Musk the biggest pay deal in corporate American history worth $56 billion. The electrical vehicle company is asking shareholders to vote on its chief executive's record-breaking pay that was set in 2018. However, the deal was rejected by a U.S. judge in January who described it as an unfathomable sum. It comes just days after Musk announced plans to cut more than 10% of its global workforce. In a memo issued to staff, Musk said there was nothing he hated more, but it must be done. Britain's Upper House of Parliament rejected for a fourth time a piece of legislation needed to enable British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda in a vote that will delay but not block one of Sunak's flagship policies. The legislation is seen by the government as crucial to overcoming existing legal barriers to the scheme under which the government wants to start sending asylum seekers arriving illegally in Britain to Rwanda to have their claims processed. And a man who set fire to two men as they left mosques in Britain last year was sentenced to indefinite detention in hospital. Britain's Crown Prosecution Service said Mohammed Abakar was found guilty of attempting to murder two elderly men in separate incidents as they walked home, one from a mosque in London in February and another in Birmingham central England in March. The CPS said there was no evidence a backer 29-year-old was motivated by a particular ideology, so the incidents were not treated as a terrorist attack. And the United Nations Security Council is scheduled to vote Friday on a Palestinian request for full UN membership, according to diplomats, a move that Israel's allies, the United States, is expected to block because it would effectively recognize a Palestinian state. The 15-member council is due to vote at 3 p.m. Friday on a draft resolution that recommends to the 193-member UN General Assembly that the state of Palestine be admitted to the membership of the United Nations. This is new to I'm Dennis Aceto. Good morning. Ninety four point four Spice FM, Nairobi. Okay, at a few minutes after 9 o'clock, uh, traffic still continues in certain parts of the city. It's been a fantastic day today because I don't think there's been much of it. Um, taking a look at the thicker superhighway, what was happening going through towards that Pangani underpass, actually gone now. And we're just dealing with a little bit of that coming in from Kiambu Road, going through towards Mufaiga Square. And then as you come off Waiaki Way, some, um, actually none left now uh, out of traffic hour early today but of course what we're going to do is keep an eye on things and see what happens as we go through the morning here for it talk to a spice fm ke on x hashtag the situation room This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom, in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, Pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latif, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room. At the only way to start... Welcome to the final hour of Kenya's biggest conversation this morning. Um, been quite something today. And as we get into that, a different conversation taking place um, right about now. But I have to ask you, what is your plan? Uh, if you say, this is my plan. This is what I want to do in the next 10 years. This is what I want to do over the next 20 years. And ICA Lion says, you know what? 
come have a conversation with us before we used to tell you what to do we would tell you this is a plan this is a plan plug in now they're saying we get it guys what's your plan what do you want to do let's hear where your mind is and then we can come together and come up with something great that will then help you bring it to reality in the future so you can get onto the website it's plan.icealion.co.ke or send an email to plan at icealion.co.ke and get that plan activated well on your way to the future okay so here we are uh, getting into this conversation for this hour there have been many conversations um, there is quite a robust one going on around the continent today about what's happening with the state of children and the certain definitions that we would need to look at when it comes to who children are um, do youth still make up some kinds of youth still make up kinds of parts of children um, what policies are, ha are being put in place? What emphasis is being laid on how children are treated? And we're going to get into some conversations um, over time. But this hour, specifically, we're going to be talking about the youth dividend in Africa, challenges and opportunities in the labor market. And uh, to help us in that conversation this morning is uh, Samuel Munuwini, who is the executive director and head of research at the African Institute for Children's Studies. Not a stranger to the Situation Room. Samuel, good morning. Good morning, Do and City. Thank Kar you. Karibu sana. Thank you for being here this morning. City went to Cape Verde. Mm -hmm. And he came back with a basket of proverbs this week. And the proverb for today might be an interesting one for you, Samuel. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. An aging man gets closer to his land. And an aging husband gets closer to his wife. Wow. Mm. That's interesting. Um... And I, I think as I live longer, I appreciate that certain perspectives get clearer, that some things get more important. And uh, let me emphasize the second part. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like the second one. Uh -huh. I like the second one. Mm -hmm. Because for sure, uh, what is very obvious with time is relationships mm. perhaps is the most thing you count. No wonder we see older people perhaps grandparents asking the younger ones when is when am i getting my grandchild mm. <laughs> because then you realize it's not the land only that is most important indeed <laughs> well there you go so very relevant to yeah. what we're talking about absolutely i need to just make the connections right uh, off and getting right off the bat into this let's give some context um to this and why these are budding conversations and looking at one specifically for kenya uh, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we saw that um, there has been the call, right, to reduce the amount of and scale down on the kind of work that children would do um, in the country. A case has even been taken to court whereby we've been said, we've been told the work that children will do even on a holiday um, can be tantamount to parents then being prosecuted. And so that helps us to delve into this and we say, yeah, sure, okay, youth are looking for employment, youth are looking for things to do, youth are looking for jobs. Let's start off with the current situation. And we talk about the youth dividend here around the continent and even now zoning in on Kenya. What is the current state of work, um, of opportunities um, for young people uh, today? Well, uh, once again, let me just say thank you for once again inviting me mm -hmm. into this. Uh, and um, one, as a parent, mm -hmm. and, and many of us, if you have any young people around you, we are all very concerned about the well-being of children. But mm -hmm. I think the most challenging part is when they are transitioning into the adulthood. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to present this conversation not just as my own experience and what I do at African Institute, but also there's a project we are doing with a group of partners called the NIA mm. project. NIA um, is not invisible anymore. Mm. Uh, and looking at sectors that are able to, one, provide opportunity for the young people, like we're talking about employment, unemployment, but also ensure that there's protection of young people, because mm. again, that's what you have. Uh, but appreciating that this is really a continental conversation, I think we need to look at what is now, you know, popularly known as the youth bulge. Mm. 
uh, that as we have more people you know improved improvement in maternity care and reduced mortality at that stage uh, and again a little more people able to live um, but the access or the fertility rate still while well, they have reduced I mean in the sense that the number of children per household is reducing across the continent there's still quite a number so while you have most population curves having a narrow tip you know there are few older people mm -hmm. and many more younger we are now beginning to see in countries like Tunisia uh, South Africa where the middle is bulging mm -hmm. and we are having almost about 25 to almost 40 percent of the populations in this country being between the age of 15 to about 29. Now that is what we are now referring to as as a dividend mm. if it translates into a positive outcome to the to the country in terms of productivity. Mm. But it can also be quite a bomb if that age group is not provided with opportunities. Mm -hmm. And um, therefore asking ourselves what is it that children can do because across the world uh, from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, our own laws in Kenya and most uh, countries in the continent, we know that uh, from 0 to 18 years, mm. it's a child. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about a 15-year-old to about 18, then there's someone who is still a child, yet you don't expect that everyone will easily fall into the frameworks that we've developed you mm -hmm. know that uh, a good example is our kenya law on uh, the basic education act it says if you cause anyone who is below within the age of basic education and our basic education now is up to the secondary school yeah if you cause them to leave school and do work then you are, you, you you are liable to prosecution mm -hmm. um yet the employment act uh, for kenya 2007 allows persons up to the age of from the age of 16 mm -hmm. to do work that is not hazardous now the question will be why would you allow children 16 year olds to work but it, it's really out of responding to a very practical problem if i left my primary school education in uh, former class eight mm -hmm. or you know many times you are a 14 year old mm -hmm. Should I sit and wait until I'm 18 to do something? There is the argument that there should be opportunity to provide you life uh, uh, vocational skills. Yeah. Many times this would go will not go beyond two years. So by the time someone is already 16 years, they literally have nothing else to do. Um, and again, you can't be forced to stay on into secondary school or all the way to the university. So there is a gap there which the law is responding to in the Employment Act. Mm. And this is consistent with the ILO Convention one, um, 173, which, which is looking at the minimum age convention. Mm. So all, all this, this is really the gap that we want to address as a continent. Okay. Now, I think this is really beyond statistics. Mm. Uh, if you walk to your neighborhood today, there are a lot of young people who are sitting and idling. And, and you know what that means. Those who are not in school. Those who are not in school. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and think about uh, a lot of our education systems in Kenya and most countries in the region is we have about a million, you know, young people who sit for their grade 8 exam. Mm -hmm. And only about half will be sitting for their form 4 exam. Mm -hmm. So you're losing half. By the time they get to university, it's quite a number. Mm -hmm. So however much we want to talk about all the nice packaging about what the law has mm. the question is what do you do where are the 500,000 going to yeah the government says it creates uh, it's supposed to create about 500,000 jobs per year but remember every year looking at our population growth we are having almost a million people coming yes. in so so this is really um, the gap that we need to be very practical about because again if you don't plan for them then the other plans will come in. We're seeing the risks on terrorism. Mm. We're seeing the risks on mental health issues, drug and substance uh, abuse. And, 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 and so it's, we have to be very practical. And, and you look at our current government and the manifest uh, that they presented and said we will create employment. Mm. But are we seeing some very practical things? Mm -hmm. uh, as much as I'm referring to the ILO conventions and what the World Bank is doing, the other thing to ask ourselves is how Afrocentric 
are some of these things. If you're talking about a, a continent, mm. are we talking about very practical solutions to yeah. some of the things that you're presenting? So, if, if we look at it, it's sometimes difficult to have this kind of a conversation because it would appear as though there are certain gaps and then we're trying to fill the, within those gaps and then still trying to play and be safe. According to the law, 0 to 13 absolutely don't work. Then there seems to be something they in... They can do... There's light work, there's light work between 11 and 13, and 13. because the other good thing which mm. is a bit a focus from even a very african perspective yeah. that we expect that you you are trained into work mm. uh, you're prepared to do adult chores and, um, and and that should be done very in a way that doesn't affect your your other rights mm. and development okay so if we get to 11 to 13 and then somewhere in there between 13 and 16 is it Please stop me if i'm wrong between 13 and 16 uh, there are certain things you absolutely cannot do and i believe one of the words they brought in there was sufferation you know and then somehow at 17 you're able 16 to 17 then you're able to do anything really uh, that would constitute work but at the same time there's this other layer where we are saying between 0 and 18 or rather what from school going age until you must uh, be in school how do we take care of those because how do we take care of those very clear and evident gaps whereby again there's a drop off every year of about 500,000 students who do not go on to finish uh, the secondary school but finish primary school what should be happening with them precisely that and and uh, <clears throat> so if, if we look at it from uh, an international framework, I mean, and, you know, when we do treaties, it's mm. because we are responding to really practical issues over time. Mm -hmm. You know, so going back in as far as 19, in the 70s and the conversations, you know, looking back into what happened in the World War um, and how nations responded to, to so many young people who ended up not having gone to school, perhaps, or didn't have the opportunity because they were in crisis. We have... I made reference to the ILO mm. Convention on Minimum Age, which then said there should be a time when you must be protected to remain in school. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do we balance that with the element of, do you just sit back? Yes. How, how, do you, how do you get the training? So you rightly put it that we have three levels of work. Mm. There is what we're calling light work. Mm. Uh, then there is work that you'll allow children to do. Mm -hmm. You know, So a lot of light work would be what you do in domestic space yeah. you know within your household uh, but there's some kind of tasks that you should be able to do as a young person that gives you an opportunity not just to learn but also to earn mm. and uh, that is addressed in the ILO convention uh, that we call the worst forms of child labor mm. but then if you look at the reality of the situation what is it that forces children to abandon schooling because it is, the assumption seems to be that the chores that they may be given in a home setting would prevent them from learning. And yet, from what I observe, it doesn't. The chores that one performs at home are just chores that one performs at home. Mm -hmm. And schooling is still schooling. It, it, it's like you understand that this is your contribution to the household. Now, perhaps this is probably more visible in a rural setting where the day starts very, very early for everybody. I mean, in the urban areas, it has also happened because children wake up early so that they can get to school because of the school rounds and the buses. Mm -hmm. But in a rural setting, there are distinct and definite chores that one must be involved in every day before they go to school. Now, if children are not going to school, what are the major contributors to this? Is it the domestic setup? I remember the a time when the scourge of HIV killed very many adults and very many people who would be the breadwinners. Many children children were forced to take up certain roles if they are the older ones so that they could look after the younger ones because there was nobody else to look after uh, the younger children. That is a unique situation. But if we're looking at today we're in the, tw the 21st century and the issues around the 21st century, what would we say prevents children from going to school because if they then don't go to school and they are supposed to contribute to the livelihood of the family mm. what are the circumstances that brings that about mm. so one 
let, let's be very clear that we are not advocating to say that uh, a child should not be in school and should work. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think there are three places children should spend their time. Uh, one is that they're at school, mm -hmm. you know, for school, uh, school age. Either they are playing or they're just at home bonding with the family and doing stuff. But then there are circumstances that push children to work. And uh, in the case of Kenya, we've had about a million children who are in in, um, in exploitative work situation. Mm. So it, it is not correct and it should be stopped. Um, a lot of that is driven by socioeconomic issues, household uh, poverty issues, um, children trying to, to, to bridge in the gap between their income yeah, within the households. And... Um, of course, there are limited opportunities in being able to continue with, with education. Um, and these have been progressively addressed, really in a great way. Uh, I must say, I started doing my work on addressing child labor issues in, in, the, uh, late, in the early 2000s. And in those periods, we could see trucks, you know, in Kiambu, mm. referring children mm. uh, to go pick coffee, mm. to go pick tea. Mm -hmm. If you go into the media archives, you will see photographs. It is very rare that you will see that today. Today. So that, that has, has reduced. But then there are certain contexts where children are still going into, uh, especially the informal space. And here we are talking about the small-scale agriculture uh, groups in the domestic work sector, uh, where we have about 2 million people working, and 30% of that are young people including children, sometimes as young as 10 years, mm -hmm. who've been uh, pushed into that. Again, we've done quite well in pushing our social protection policies. And uh, they're supposed to be cash transfer programs uh, for the elderly, for the young people, so that they are able to, to have their needs met. But when you look at, you know, the, the, the books and research that has been done on child labor, for example, the truth is there's going to be a young person who, yes, has the ability to go to school, uh, but they're not interested. Either I'm just not coping with the formal education mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that in itself is anything illegal. It is therefore, how do you provide for one, their protection? And therefore the conversation today should also look at, are there sectors where young people can work in safely? And I'm talking about 16 years and above, because mm -hmm. that's what our Employment Act allows. Um, for example, the domestic work sector. Mm. If I was going to work there, how do you promote decent work? Mm. Um, we are heading into the Labor Day. I think we have a few days. Yeah. And, and one of the sectors that the president promised to ratify a convention, ILO 189, um, and the ILO convention 190. So the 189 is looking at the domestic work and how to make it a decent space for work for everyone. Uh, appreciating that there's private and public and, and the, the opportunity in that, mm -hmm. but also that um, the ILO 190 looks at the violence and all that. Mm -hmm. So it is opening up a space where we can ask ourselves, if young people will be forced to work, mm -hmm. where can they do that uh, safely? Again, the law appreciated that there is an age that people may be forced to work. Yeah. So I, I think, City, the point is there are some socioeconomic factors and we must do everything within the policy to be able to address that. Mm. There are also heavy mindset issues when, uh, you know, and a, a lot of this mindset in some, wait, some instances, this mindset will be born from culture, um, whereby if we look at traditional settings that we do know just from studies or things that we've been told down past through oral tradition, that there were folks who had many children because these children, as they reached a certain age, would then be able to help them on their farm, which was the primary source um, of, for sustenance. And that you would not have to hire help, but that the children, of course, this was before formal education came in, that children would essentially then be able to give a helping hand. But even with the advent of formal education, we've seen that this has traversed that time period and for many it's still in the mind that you have this number of children so that they can help you later so could it be a mindset whereby we're saying okay well look we, we we're saying don't according to the law but then you still have people who are dipped culturally in a certain mindset is it possible to have a combination of those two to say look well in the instances whereby we say that work was required mm -hmm. by children to do and here we say where there is no option can we then make it safe for them to work and earn 
for livelihoods? I, I think there are two uh, issues here. You, you know, sometimes we really focus on this person who we are saying, you know, keep them away from that. And, and I, I don't know how you are 14 to 20 years of age was a uh, mm -hmm. city. You know, there, there's a photograph of mine that uh, I posted uh, on Facebook. I was tempted to bring that here. Um, you know, I was running my little kibanda. And this was right after my phone four. Mm. I hadn't even had my, my ID. Mm. Uh, I, I was a hawker, you know, in my little uh, town. Mm. And, and, you know, I had my various things that I was selling. Mm -hmm. But what is the impact of that? Is there a positive impact on that? So I think even as we look at asking ourselves, at what age do we introduce young people to this? Mm. Can you create entrepreneurs from an early exposure to a protected space? Of engagement mm. you know think about the US you know the US is I think the only country now that has not signed one convention uh, this is a convention on the rights of the child mm -hmm. and the reason why they have not is they engage young people in things like military their trainings from the age of 14 15 16 what does that tell you that there is something that if you want to train young people uh, really on very specialized skill sets, then you've got to do it very early. Mm -hmm. Is that very different from the cultural space that we've had? I don't think so. No, think think about the blacksmiths and all that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think sometimes we quickly want to demonize our, our African traditional way of doing things. But there's a, a lot of positivity mm -hmm. in that. You know, if, if your father was a blacksmith, you needed to sit and work with them. But that did not deny you a chance to go to play, mm -hmm. didn't give you a chance to how to build your skills if it's a formal education so and we've made it very clear that as long as a young person will be able to continue with education during school hours they're not doing things that expose them to either physical hazards or moral hazards you know um, then it is proper and appropriate to be able to expose young people to work and and i think that's really where we've also missed it as a continent mm. that a lot of education system has been designed in a way where the focus is you're prepared to finish your secondary school, go to the university, learn how to write, learn to, and in between here, we miss out a lot. Mm. Uh, I want to give an example. I think uh, there's a friend who explained to me about a young man who was from a fairly wealthy family mm -hmm. in this city. And uh, he had the chance to be taken to any university in the world. But in his early stage, one of the exposures he had was a chance to go and work uh, sit along with a friend who was doing uh, construction, you know, uh, building doors, you know, the wooden doors. Mm -hmm. And when he finished his form four, he said, well, I think I don't want to go to the university. Can you help me set up this? And now he's doing those wooden doors that will cost like half a million shillings for one door, you know. Mm -hmm. He's grown into that. So I think what, what I'm trying to balance here is we have a problem. And we need very practical solutions. Mm -hmm. We're saying we have a huge population of young people who don't have something to do. And will we sit back and keep saying, we'll wait for the formal space to be able to create employment. But how can we instead provide more internships, you know, in very practical spaces where you're creating uh, products, solutions to things. And, and, and this is where including uh, looking at even very informal spaces like mm -hmm. the domestic workspace. Now, why I'm emphasizing this is, I'll give, give you another very practical example. Mm -hmm. There's a young man who was about 17 years old, was working in a domestic workspace, and the employer chose to send this person to learn how to do Spanish dishes here in Nairobi, mm -hmm. in the UN uh, Giguric area. And uh, out of that learning, this young man now had become a specialized chef, so to say. In, in doing uh, mm -hmm. Spanish dishes. Mm -hmm. And that exposed him to a new market. So there is a sector there that gives you an opportunity to train young people into something, but not just because I'm here as an exit. Mm. Can we look at some of our workspaces and think about adding value on how they do their work in that space? Mm -hmm. and, and I think to me, there's therefore this balance between cultural uh, discussion vis-a-vis uh, how do we do our things? Yeah. And really reviewing how the colonialist and some of the early education systems were designed that literally didn't allow us mm. to build skills. To build skills. Okay, let's take a break on that note. It's 28 minutes to 10 o'clock. We'll come back and look at, okay, so what sectors do we have in the country? What sectors are there here that you can actually say, you know what, that 500,000 that dropped off, 
here's an opportunity for them we'll take a break look at weather traffic and come back and continue right after this this is the situation room the only way to start your day Revenge is for children. Mm. It's for kids. When you grow up, you realize the best revenge you, you can take on somebody is to ignore them. Now I'm just new in politics. Mm. It is not everybody's cup of tea. That's why some people come in one time and that's it for them. Political parties in this country do not have ideologies, whether luring or otherwise. And that is the effect of corruption. Any time an offense occurs anywhere in the country, it is the job of the Inspector General to look into it. Whether it's corruption, whether it's murder, whether it's petty, that is his job. If we have chosen to be a corrupt nation, then we produce corrupt leaders. Everything then becomes chaotic that you cannot be able to change a nation. The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. The right, weather to, uh, with Spice uh, FM. In Nairobi, we'll see highs of 26 and highs of 27 um, in uh, sunny Nakuru. It's uh, sunny at 20 in Yeri and we'll see highs of 26 and we'll see highs of 26 in a sunny Eldoret currently at 19. It's 27 and sunny in Mombasa with highs of 29 and we'll see highs of 30 um, in Malindi where it's sunny at 27. 25 and sunny in Kisumu with highs of 30 while Kakamega will go to highs of 30. It's currently sunny at 23. Kampala, the rain showers continue at 24 going to highs of 28 while in Dar es Salaam at 26 it's cloudy with highs of 30. At 16 johannesburg is sunny with highs of 22 while mogadishu um, is partly sunny and windy this morning at 32 21 and mostly cloudy in addis ababa while lagos is sunny at 28 we'll see highs of 34 it's cloudy at 26 in kinshasa going to highs of 33 a quick look into beijing thursday afternoon 29 degrees while paris is cloudy at uh, 5 london is sunny at 6 10 degrees and cloudy in new york with highs of 10 and lows of 8 Spice up your life. Really, go where you need to go today and be back in 10 minutes because traffic has not been a problem today at all. And I think while easily out of traffic hour at this point, most of your roads clear um, today. Little uh, pots here and there. The Thicker Superhighway has done very well. Well done. Three claps for the Thicker Superhighway. Um, everything else seems to be looking good right about now. Let's see what happens through the day. And of course, keep us in touch. Spice FM, KE on X. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. All right, it's uh, 24 minutes to 10 o'clock and uh, more of this conversation where this morning we're looking at some practical ways. We're looking at the youth dividend and saying, where can they actually fit in? Because we can have the conversation, we can sometimes pontificate and say, no, absolutely, they're children, they must not work. Okay, that's nice. Uh, but then formal education, we have seen, and I think, are we getting to the point where we accept formal education, finishing education, doing an interview, getting a job is not for the majority of people. It's not for the majority of students that we've seen um, falling off the grid, um, essentially. Um, and Samuel, even as we continue that conversation, you mentioned something as we we're coming off, uh, going into that break, that isn't it about time where we said, you know what, can you take them and put them in uh, a hands-on internship, for example? How would you see that happening um, today? Good point, uh, Ndu. And... Uh uh, maybe back into a bit of context issues here that uh, in Kenya, for example, the 15 to 24 year olds, who, which is really the age where you're prepared to get ready uh, to go to work, is about 5 million people. Mm. And uh, Kenya has about 15% of those without work, mm. nothing they're doing. And um, we know the risk of, of, of all that. Now, what are the opportunities in a formal employment space? Mm. In Kenya, and a lot of African countries, you'd be talking about less than 15% of any country will mm. be doing formal employment. Yeah. Um, 
so here we have another 85 percent of the working age generally again mm -hmm. from 16 to about 64 uh, who will likely to get a job in the informal what is informal mm. well, well a lot of times when you say informal space it means they're not registered by a registrar of company maybe the systems of regulating that is, is not there the labor officer may not be able to walk in there mm. they're not taxable um so is it possible to find another very practical way in which we bring in the young people mm -hmm. uh in, into that space so one again we emphasize that as long as possible keep children in school uh, there are many other benefits especially for girls for example you will notice that uh, uh, you reduce the risk of teenage pregnancy child marriage yeah. um, which again come in with the other benefits that you're not bringing in health complications and all that but then there is this person who will not be just there sitting and, and waiting yeah so i think one is that as a continent we must be able to look into learning from other countries. Mm -hmm. Think about the cottage industries, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, th there are a lot of products that you can be able to grow, and the governments must be very deliberate in saying, if how do you add value to something like, for example, rice, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or cassava, and and how do you allow young people to get into that space where they are part of the cottage industry? You know, when when you travel to other countries, like when I've been to West Africa. Uh, they do like seven ways of preparing cassava mm -hmm. you know and some of that are products that have value add that you can go and buy in the in the supermarket yeah. that means therefore you are able to provide so i think it's it's really being able to look at this kind of cottage industries and providing spaces where young people learn through family learn and and be able to to run and, and build on that as opportunities for them mm. uh, to work in um and again that's where we are saying even in other sectors uh, like domestic work uh, is there an opportunity and and we really have to stop looking at cottage industries or work that is done in there just as a by the way but where there is actual value addition and you can see that you're growing uh, you know some of the big companies that we have today began from a kitchen mm -hmm. you know the kfc's of this world mm -hmm. were literally someone's kitchen yeah. uh, how, how do you grow into into those kind of opportunities here mm -hmm. and microsoft or someone's garage right exactly <laughs> you know the um, what we call informal and informal learning is a very fundamental pillar in the process of development of children if you look at the chores that children are given at home make your bed wash your own dishes or your own clothes in a certain age. It inculcates an element of discipline and an appreciation mm -hmm. of the importance of these chores. And it also inculcates in you the ability to do things. Now, if you have um, a very forward-looking group of parents, it will go beyond that. And you'll find that the functions and the duties within a home are if they are both boys and girls, it's spread equally. There is no division of labor as to mm. the girls will do this. Everyone does everything. Mm. Yep. Now, you see the benefit of that when that person is older in the way they handle things. For instance, a person who develops that way as a man, as a young man, you'll find they respect women a great deal more mm -hmm. than someone who grew up in a family where there was that clear demarcation you know, that is not for boys, that is not for this and the other. But more importantly, if you look at Communities where who are business minded and the age at which children are introduced to business. It doesn't interfere with their learning mm -hmm. a shop mm. The child may be doing nothing. They just hang around in the shop But every once in a while they are sent to get this get this they're learning they get to a certain age They're even allowed to sell to the, exactly. to, the to, 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 to customers after a while they're even allowed to manage the money now you tell me if this child then continue the formal education and acquires a skill beyond that Whatever business they were involved in, that child will already have the capacity to improve on that business and grow it to the next level. But let me bring, come back to formal learning. Mm -hmm. You want to ask, you asked me about China. To understand what you asked, you need to look at the curriculum, mm -hmm. what they teach. One of the, teach, they te the things they teach is ideology. Exactly. It is curriculum. You learn it. Mm -hmm. So this communism that people speak of, you are taught, so you understand it. But if I take that example yet to another country, like say Estonia, okay, where part of the curriculum is that you must have a business plan. 
Mm-hmm. So that by the time you're graduating, say in your form four, form six, you have gone to university. Part of what you examined in is the practicability of your project. Mm. Can it actually work as a business? Now you tell me, what stops that person from growing that business as they move along? Because it's part of the educational system. So the answer to the question is, what is it that we have in our curriculum that encourages the very things that we want? So that it isn't something that is sprung on you when you finish from four. Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. Primary school, as you go through school, this is something that you're interacting with. Yeah. You asked me what I did uh, when I was 14. Mm. I had parents who make sure that every holiday were in the rural areas. Yeah. Every, without fail. Mm-hmm. So when people wake up in the morning to go to the shamba, so do you. Yeah. When they're milking shows, you also milk. When you have to go to the river to get water, you go to the river to get water. At a certain point, that's very early morning. Then on certain days, you are the one who takes the cattle, the cows out. Mm. So you get to know about cows. And you go to, a, you, and by the way, all these cows had names. It doesn't matter how many they are. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, you got, so you got to know them. And then you, you, you learned how to milk. Mm. Now, it may not appear useful then, but as you get older, you're suddenly very, very grateful that you had parents who made you go through that process. Mm. And it doesn't impede on your academic learning. Because what it imbues in you is discipline. So when you transfer that discipline to formal learning, formal learning for you doesn't become a chore. Exactly. It's, mm. it's not because you already accustomed to discipline. Just didn't understand it. Waking up in the morning, going to the shamba, doing all these things. Mm. And it's every single day. Exactly. Uh, so, Siti, uh, you know, back to our practical problem here. We're yes. saying we have a 1.3 billion African population, mm. 25% yeah. percent of it, mm. 15 to 24. And you're thinking about productivity of the people. You know, um, in my experience of running business, uh, you know, it reminds me of a book by Lee Ikoka. You know, um, he talked about the three P's of business. Yes, that was a man who was known in the motor industry of Detroit. Exactly, you know. Yes. And, and, and he really emphasized, I read that book really, uh, I think in my high school, mm-hmm. just as a good book. And, and the three P's have become so alive for me today that for any space where productivity is being looked at, you must think about the people besides the product and the profits. How much do we invest in the, in the capital, the human capital in this continent, mm. you know? So think about when I receive people at a workplace, often really, I mean, I've had people whom have never looked at their certificates and they, we've worked for three, four years because what I'm looking at is problem solving. Mm. Are you able to solve problems? Where do we create problem solving solvers? I think number one, it is in the zero to four years. What you feed your children in at that age, mm. because that's where brain development is being, is being prepared, so that you have brains that can create solutions, critical thinkers. Right. It really begins at that age. Mm. So what are we feeding our mothers in when the children are in the womb? Mm. Are they accessing folic acid? Are they? So if a government invested very heavily mm. on a zero to four, and, and in terms of school, the feeding programs and all that, you, in the next 20 years, you will see the difference that that population will think very differently. Mm. What is the other space that you have to be able to create a productive population that will create jobs for this continent? Mm. It is again the 15 to 24, a very critical space. Because if you had a good brain in the beginning, you've been exposed to how to communicate, to how to, you've been exposed to internships, like we are saying. The next space is then to allow you a safe space to be a creative person. And, and that is why this age group, becomes very, very critical for us to look at and allow them to be that creative thinkers. Hmm. The issue of child exploitation comes into play here. And even if you're, even if you're saying, you know what, can we have a bit of a formalized process whereby those children creating spaces whereby they can actually benefit something, even if it is not in a formal education, and now we're saying in work, how then do we protect them as well from being exploited because the natural inclination is pay them less give them longer working hours because we assume that they're more agile and they don't get tired as much pay them less because after all what are they using the money for right so how then do we then also create protection Mm -hmm. around them even when we're saying look open up the space for them to work because right now there's nothing else how do we protect them at the same time because they're still vulnerable exactly yeah and, and, uh, and uh, this is where the conversation and uh, of the ILO Convention 190 that is looking at uh, the violence at workspace and uh, opening it up to more regulatory 
uh, processes mm -hmm. is. And so we are hoping our president uh, can lead the pack in Africa by among the, the countries that will sign up this convention 190. Uh, and, and when I've done audits or evaluated programs on child labor in this country and talk to people from the Ministry of, of Labor, Really, I, I don't know if anyone has ever come and knocked your space to ask what is the age of the person you are employing, mm. you know, are they, if they are below 18, do they have access to other skills training that you're providing for them? So the element of monitoring these workspaces mm. become very, very critical. Um, I know there is a push in Kenya even by the revenue authority to try and register as many you saw the other day even farmers and the number of crops in their farm mm. allegedly being counted mm. um so there's that element the opportunity of creating uh formalizing a bit of this but i think the drive doesn't need to come from the from the government side and the tax um there are opportunities let me the, the one person uh, whom i would love to learn about more is history uh like parapet you, you must be familiar with the parapet the company that yeah. does cleaning services mm -hmm. a few years when i think this company started when i was in the university and then you had to employ this person who works mm. the whole month mm. but they only clean the first one hour and they sit Another. back the whole day take yeah. tea mm -hmm. and wait and go so what was the opportunity is that this person creates one company that has as many people who come and do your one hour they go to the next house do the same so i see the opportunity in allowing some of these sectors including the domestic service sector mm. to be able to create companies that then will allow this kind of young people to come in it is more regulated because to, i mean today one of the, the most difficult things for any parent who wants to employ a domestic worker is will they abuse my child we've seen the things that are happening mm. you know sometimes even smashing a child on the wall uh, very bad outcomes that we, we've experienced but if you had someone else who's done that bit of saying as you come in we have a structure that will be able to do the vetting mm. that will be able to check you know uh, do routine monitoring uh, because I think sometimes the private sector because of the motivation to remain in business can provide the opportunity for a more regulated workspace not in a, at all diminishing the importance of the Ministry of Labor and other government agencies mm -hmm. but then adding value to that sector mm -hmm. and using it as a provide to provide the employment that is badly needed by the continent mm. but there are still ways to then protect them then from being exploited isn't it exactly mm. exactly and 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 uh, from a child rights point uh, the beginning of a good protective environment one is the child themselves mm. so you know empowering young people with the information on what is acceptable within a workspace you know it's it's very unfortunate that even in very empowered spaces we see things like sexual violence mm. that that keep happening even among the adults but when you have information and when you have spaces where you can report some of these violations mm. you know um, in kenya for example we have the 116 line that is run by child in kenya that i can call and there'll be an effective response mechanism mm. Mm. so I, I think part of the gap in being able to do protection is sometimes the legal framework mm -hmm. and those in authority to protect young people um, or anyone for that matter in our workspace will often not appreciate you know their role in that you actually blamed mm. you know uh, but think for a moment look at certain um, disciplines if I may use the term and regulation if any exists or the formalization of it look at security I'm talking about, say, the private guards. Mm. You're talking about house help. Mm. See, these are very, very key. They're very, very fundamental. They're, they're very necessary. But look at the investment that you find being put into it. Because our mindset seems to be that somebody who is a domestic worker should be paid as little money as possible. Exactly. And even the training that a domestic worker should have, you assume by the fact that they are, they've grown up they should know domestic work right. and it is not true no 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 and so so go, yes yes and and uh, i think that realization has been there um in countries like kenya uh, i know there are groups that have invested in training for example the center for domestic uh, training services. yes yes they have mm. they have um and 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 therefore I, I think the opportunity is there it must be regulated further you see mm. the you see the for instance, now, when you talk about private security guards, they, 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 you even have uh, a government body that is supposed to oversee the functions and what have you. 
But do they really? I, I, I mean, if you look at the places where we live and look at the sort of guards that they bring there, you have never come across a lot of more tired individuals than those ones. Mm. Yes. In fact, you really wonder, this person, when was the last time they ate? Mm. Or at the slightest opportunity, they, they're dozing off. So you get the impression, this person probably has more than one job. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at what they are paid and what the government states they should be paid. Right. It's an amount, when you're living in Nairobi, you're wondering, how exactly. does this person survive with this amount of money mm -hmm. in Nairobi? Where do they live? How do they even eat? How do they even come to work? And then this is the person you're entrusting with security. Mm. Or with your child. Or with your child. <laughs> no, yeah, no, precisely. <laughs> you know, uh, Let me take it further. Yes. When you look at ECD and the emphasis we've given ECD, the rhetoric around it is good. The talk around it is good. The structures of which have been put is good. But... Surely, the individuals who are given the responsibility of training your child, your children, at an age when actually they know absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Should this not be the group of people who are perhaps best remunerated? Mm. Because when that child grows up and they move on to the next stage in the uh, sec uh, primary school, they know a little bit more. Secondary school, they know a lot more. Yeah. But look at how it is skewed. Where the child already knows a lot and just requires a little help as they move along, that person gets remunerated much better than the person who did the heavy lifting. Mm. You're right, City. We, we, I think two things that we really have to happen, change in our continent, and maybe beginning with Kenya, mm. is one, I think we'll have to pay people by time mm. and outputs. Mm. This thing of being paid per month, yeah. uh, without looking at the productivity then leads people into this kind of arrangements and 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 we look at the conventions that we're talking about actually looking at how do we improve the the payments yeah. uh, the second bit on that so you know when you move people into hourly again if i give the example of say the security industry or this um, or the domestic uh, work sector if i will come in and just put my two hours mm. when you really need need me, it and you know that every hour, say, is 300 shillings mm. or, or 400 shillings, mm -hmm. then I'm able to live and go do something else. But if I add cumulative to my eight hours that I will have worked, I'll have been paid better. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and even for the person who is paying for the service, they, f they find that they have better, uh, better return from their money. Mm. Uh, I, I think the other bit that um, we, we really have to look for as, as a continent in, in trying to address this is some of these jobs don't have to be an end in themselves just because i'm a security person is there a, a system that allows me to grow in it so if i'm employed in security or domestic work can i be able to see that there is career growth opportunities mm -hmm. can i move beyond having worked in one house because now i've known how to manage to be the janitor who manages in a hotel system right. and move on to the next mm -hmm. level so i think really appreciating that there's the informal sector is the one that gives us most jobs we must therefore be able to create opportunities for growth in there and is to incentivize the, those who are in the private sector and trying to, to you yeah. know, are manage these, that. Are these conversations being had at the level whereby uh, the creation of policy would then lead towards implementation of some of these things at the places where they ought to be uh, happening? Are they currently being had? Um, so I, I, I work in the non-profit sector and, yeah. and, and, and trying to advocate, and we are, we are in spaces. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you an example. We just came from a, a meeting that was looking at ratifying the Convention 189. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had the officers from the Ministry of Labor, from Treasury. And of course, the question before the president signs that is being asked is, if we increase the minimum wage mm -hmm. to what is more acceptable, more within the global space, will a country be able to enforce it? That's a question. And, and, and that's where we are putting in some very practical measures, therefore, mm -hmm. to address that, because there's no point of just doing that. Uh, the country at the moment is revising its national child uh, labor policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, there is an opportunity. But in my opinion, I think we really need to go back into working with those who are creating opportunities in some of these sectors and create, e encourage them, first of all, to grow. Because unfortunately, some of the way our governments have approached private sector in the in this kind of service industry is very punitive mm. many times you're almost being cut down instead of being encouraged to grow mm. uh, so that the regulations and saying no one should work uh, as a child 
must be looked at from a point also how do we create more people who can learn mm. how do we encourage regulation so that there is no exploitation as defined in the ILO mm. Commission 19 you know when one talks of regulations and the law and then one looks at the practicability of it and then one looks at the emphasis and the focus that african governments or a kenyan government gives to the youth beyond rhetoric beyond vijana mtani yes, 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 that beyond the, mtani. yes, yes, yes be, mtani. Be, be beyond rhetoric because there's um, if the policies don't reflect or if the policies reflect but then when you come to the implementation of it what you see are gaps followed by more gaps okay we have a cbc system mm -hmm. now everything around it so long as you stick to the theory and the thinking around it very good it stops and ends right there mm. the putting it into practice has been a complete disaster mm -hmm. we have a situation where the students who were the first lot to actually move into it mm. lost almost an entire year of learning and even the goals that you are there to exp help people to be practical. So, for example, if, if I need to get a, a good picture, instead of drawing it, mm. I go print it. I actually envy those who are studying in very rural areas. I think they eventually get what is expected, that you are cr building creative minds, you know. So, it, it requires, of course, that as public, we are able to hold accountable some mm. of our systems that, that we do have. You see, that's why I said, mm. beyond the rhetoric, even as we sign conventions, and we sign those conventions as Kenya. Oh, in fact, it's mm. like we, we sign and ask, is there another one we need to sign so that yeah. we can sign it anyway? <laughs> Indeed. Look, there are many, many conversations, and we'll be delving into them, you know, in the coming weeks, about what then um, these all bleed into when we talk about practical things that ought to be done where it concerns our children and young people around this continent. Um, Samuel Munyuini, thank you so much for being here with us this morning and having that conversation and we delve into more. The Executive Director and Head of Research at the African Institute for Children's Studies. That's been our conversation this morning and just looking into, okay, so this is the problem. How can we practically bring in solutions um, for the betterment of the future of our children on the continent? Thanks for being part of Kenya's biggest conversation this morning. And to all of you, thanks for joining us. We talk again tomorrow morning. It's 10 a.m.